queued up. Start. Okay, Mr. Marshall, you are a co-host. We are recording, I believe. Let me just double check that. Yes, I see the little, I see the little light. I could see it with my screen shared. So we are good to go. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of February 16th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall. And as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Uh, we know that Jack Jemsek will be absent tonight. Uh, Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Present. And Johanna Newman. Present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. Sure. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment can also be heard and given at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so um, the time is 6.34 and we can start with item one on the agenda. Uh, the first item is uh, minutes for approval. Um, Chris or Pam, uh, as far as I know, there's only one set of minutes, which is from February 2nd, uh, our last meeting of this year, 2022. So uh, uh, so why don't we go right into discussion? Are there any comments on the minutes for our last meeting from the board? Uh, Johanna, you're raising your hand. I thought they looked really great. And they were done right after the minute, yeah. after the meeting when I can still remember it. So I, I don't know, there's more, but I would move to approve these minutes. All right. We can do that now. 
All right. Does anybody want to second that? We can't have more conversation after the second. I'm seeing Janet McGowan's hand raised, so why don't we recognize her as seconding? And anybody want to have any further discussion of these minutes from February 2nd? I do not see any hands raised. I guess we can go right into a vote. So we have a motion to approve the Jan or the February 2nd minutes. Uh, we'll go through the roll. Maria? Approve. All right, we know Jack is absent. Tom? Approve. Uh, Andrew? Aye. I'm an aye. Janet? Aye. And Johanna? Aye. All right. Um, I have one question. This will go sure, to Chris. Sure, um, so Chris, Andrew McDougall, you were, you were not here at the last meeting, is that correct? So does Andrew need to abstain versus vote in the affirmative? Uh, Chris is muted, so why don't we give, let Chris unmute herself and answer. Normally people who are not there or were not there would abstain. Um, I don't know if there's an absolute rule on that. But. Okay. I don't know right. either. I was, I've heard it multiple ways. Okay. Sorry, Doug, if I spoke at a turn, but that's that's not a problem. Uh, yeah, no, I, I've heard I've heard that it's you're, it's perfectly acceptable to abstain or to vote in the uh, in whichever way you choose. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. And and Chris, do we have any other outstanding minutes at all? I, as far as I know, we're caught up. I believe we're caught up. Yep. All right. Well, there there were, yeah. So there's minutes from November third that were reviewed by the planning board, and I believe there's a draft on the website. And we need to go back in and reconstruct what Maureen Pollock said, um, in order to that Janet had some questions about that. She said it, what Maureen said wasn't fully um, represented, although other discussions and other comments were. So I have not had a chance to go back in and reconstruct that. So the 11, 3, 21 minutes have not yet been approved. All right. But they're posted. As drafts. As drafts. As drafts. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, do you have a sense of when you might get to that? Or, or will well, it take, I hope it doesn't take an open meeting, you know, complaint to do that. <laughs> if you I don't want to, I don't want to go there. <laughs> request that I do it by the next meeting, which is when? March uh, 2nd. March so, 2nd. March, yeah, March 2nd. I will promise to do it by March 2nd. All right. Well, thank you. All right. So, um, Moving on to the second item on the agenda. Uh, the time is 6.39 and we will now take public comment. And as a reminder, this is public comment on items that are not on our agenda. So that would mean, I, I, you know, the solar bylaws uh, conversation is not allowed for this public comment period. Let's see. So I'm seeing one, Mr. Marshall. Oh, uh, there it is. I was having trouble seeing the, yes. Okay, so I see Jack Hirsch's hand. Mm -hmm. uh, Pam, why don't you bring Jack in and he can give us his name and address. Are you and, feeling uh, like three minutes? Yeah, why don't we give him three minutes? Okay. All right, Jack, you are in the participants. In Thank you very much. Very good. Now we can hear you. Okay. I'm Jack Hirsch. I live on Flat Hills Road in Amherst. And I, I had a um, general question, I guess, or maybe it was a reminder. 
but I was reading about the proposed subdivisions and I see in state law that um, allows developers to submit a somewhat fictional um, proposed subdivision plan and free zoning for seven months. And I'm just wondering what protections do individual residents have when the land is ar around them and the home that they built bought is in a residential zone and then the pressure is to change it to uh, a very different type of land use that the homeowner had no idea was as was possible in fact was relying on the zoning laws to prevent so i'm assuming is that sort of the planning board's responsibility who protects the homeowners uh chris i uh I see your hand. Why did, do you want to respond to that? Um, I'm not yeah, sure. The I board do. typically doesn't respond to public comments. So. He couched it in the form of a question, so I can try okay. to answer the question if you would let me, let me do that. Um, sure. So state law um, tries to protect the rights of landowners to develop their property. And um, when a zoning change is proposed, the landowner may fear that he will not be able to develop his property in the way that he originally thought. And so state law allows the landowner to file a subdivision plan, a preliminary subdivision plan, followed within seven months by a definitive subdivision plan. And if that definitive subdivision plan is approved by the planning board, um, then the zoning can be frozen for a period of eight years. And that's state law. And we've gone over that with our attorney. And, um, you know, that's just the fact. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. Jack, do you have any other public comment you want to continue with or not? Um, well, I would just um, mention that residents deserve some sort of, of, I understand that that's state law, but residents res should deserve some sort of reliance on zoning to protect their interests also. And if zoning change is made, isn't the theory that that's there to, for the public good, that that's what zoning is for, and it's, it's designed to protect everyone? I believe that is the just one of the sort of arguments for zoning. Yes. All right. So um, I, I don't see any other hands. Um, Pam, I guess we can move Jack back to the attendees and um, I guess move on to the third item on the agenda. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, the time now is 6.44. Um, we have as a general topic for the item three on the agenda, uh, the solar bylaw zoning proposal. Um, and, and then we may get, if we have time, we may get to some other conversation about zoning priorities for this coming calendar year. Um, so, I thought it would make sense for Chris to start the conversation. Um, you know, you sent around some thoughts this morning or this afternoon, and uh, maybe we can use that to frame the conversation. Pam, uh, I think you have those comments that, that, that Chris sent. Um, so whenever Chris is ready, you can put them on the screen so that, uh, that our listeners and, and viewers can see it. Yes. So Chris, so, go ahead. Before, um, before we talk about uh, those comments that I sent around, I wondered if I could just give a brief introduction to um, the process that we're entering into. And item A says drafting a zoning amendment on large scale solar amendments. So Stephanie Ciccarello and I have been working with um, Dave Zomek, the assistant town manager and uh, Paul Bachelman, the town manager, to um, set up a process for creating a solar bylaw, as well as for um, doing a solar resource study. And the solar resource study is an effort to um, look at land in Amherst to determine um, 
where it might be appropriate to site large scale solar installations. So um, first I wanted to say that we're all learning about zoning or solar and solar uh, installations and um, the need for solar, but we're also learning about the impacts that solar has on the landscape and the environment. So I wanted to put that out there because we don't have all the answers. We're searching for the answers and we're hoping to um, get a lot of the answers by listening to the public and by having a group that can um, kind of be the focal point for this work, the work of creating the solar bylaw and creating and, and working on the solar resource assessment. So the town manager is uh, in the process of creating a committee. And right now it's called the Solar Assessment and Bylaw Committee. Um, and it is, um, it's, it's sort of, well, the, the committee membership will be, uh, it'll, it'll be a, a temporary committee that'll be in place until we have the solar bylaw and the solar assessment done. Um, the idea is that it would be a public, uh, you know, it would have all its meetings in public and all they'd all be posted. Um, and the representatives or the membership would be uh, representatives of the Energy and Climate Action Committee, um, the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, um, the, the Water Resources Protection Committee. Um, we're hoping to get a, a forest ecologist on board. Um, we also know that we need um, a representative of the legal um, profession to advise us on legalities. Um, it's been suggested that we include a member of the Board of Health. And we'd also like to include uh, someone who knows a lot about solar installations, but is not a representative of a solar developer. Um, so this committee will have two subcommittees. This is the way it's being proposed. Uh, two subcommittees, one of which will work on work with a consultant on the solar resource assessment, and one will work on the solar bylaw. Um, the Energy and Climate Action Committee will be um, working with Stephanie Ciccarello on the Solar Resource Assessment, and um, I will be working with the Planning Board and the Planning Department staff on the Solar Bylaw. Um, and as I said, we're all learning as we go along. Um, we're hoping at the end that the deliverables will include a map showing sites in town that are considered to be suitable for solar development, for large scale solar development. And we're imagining that this map will be um, an overlay um, on, the, on the town zoning map. And then we're also uh, proposing that there be a new section of the zoning bylaw that will um, regulate solar installations. So, um, we, we have money to hire a consultant. The Energy and Climate Action Committee has, has money. And so we're going to be uh, hopefully hiring a consultant fairly soon. And um, that's kind of the, the outline or the framework of uh, how we're hoping to move forward with this. Um, the town manager has not, uh, he's, he's read this proposal. Um, I think he's generally on board with it. And it's just a question of him actually you know, finalizing this, I think he has to get um, town council approval for this new committee, and then he will be um, appointing members to it. But that's kind of the way we're envisioning working on this. So the planning board will have um, a, 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 a central role in um, creating the zoning bylaw. And um, we will be learning about the solar siting or resource assessment as we go along and aspects of that work will influence um, our work on the solar bylaw. So I just wanted to say that up front so that you have some sense of how all this, how all the pieces fit together. So oh, Chris, thank, thanks for that update. Um, that's very helpful to hear how things are coming together. One question, um, the work of this, uh, of, this, of this one or two working groups, um, will there, recommendations come to us for recommendation to town council or will their recommendations go straight to town council for council to you know recommend for a public hearing by the by the planning board or where do we fit into the process in terms of the 
after this working group? Well, I think we learned things um, from last year from, um, you know, probably some, um, I won't say missteps, but um, just, you know, we learned things about the process that we don't want to repeat this time. So we're um, proposing to keep the planning board, you know, really informed about what's going on and with planning board member or members um, on this committee, um, that the planning board members will be able to report to the planning board as well as I will be able to report to the planning board. So we're not, you know, planning to um, spring anything on you or bring it to town council before it's ready. Um, so the planning board will be part of the development of the zoning bylaw. And um, since planning board members will be on the uh, committee itself, the larger committee, um, you will be kept informed about the work of the consultant on the solar assessment. So we're hoping that by the time this is brought to town council, that you know the planning board will have had the full opportunity to discuss it and and you know change it or whatever and that the public will also have heard about it and then once we bring it to town council which we don't think will happen for several months um and it gets referred back to the planning board that you'll have a, a really good sense of what it's all about okay I guess more to come and we'll see what, what's, how it falls out or how it plays out. Janet, I see your hand. Um, Chris, thank you for that update. That was super clear and it, it sounds like a great process. Um, I have a question about um, the solar um, assessment, resources assessment committee. It seems, I wonder if we could put somebody with farming or a suggestion to add a farmer to that since most of the, um, large scale solar facilities have gone on to farmland. And I, I don't think it's like, a. Um, I think dual use sounds fantastic. I'm not sure how it's been working out. It'd be good to have somebody who really understands fields and soils and you know things like that on that committee. And I know that our farm committee is kind of in hiatus, but I wonder if somebody, if we can get a farmer involved in that. I'll make that suggestion. Obviously busy people to begin with, but. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm, I, I'm, I can't resist saying you, most of you probably don't know that I am a farmer uh, in that I, I happen to have inherited my mother's farm in the Midwest. So I uh, have a small window on farming, but it's not, I don't know much about the local uh, environment. So anyway, um, so Chris, why don't you go ahead uh, and you know, help us get into this conversation about the issues that we might be able to deal with and think about uh, with the solar bylaw now. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I, I, one other thing occurs to me, do you have an update on the solar moratorium and where that's at? I know yes. they had the first reading from council, but have they had the second one? We're expecting that the second, well, the second reading is scheduled for the 28th of February. Um, and we're hoping that they actually take a vote that night. Um, so that's that's the schedule on that one. Okay. Yep. All right. Well. So okay. So um, in your packet, you had um, two examples of solar bylaws. One was from the town of Palmer, and the other one was from Hadley. And we just sort of chose these because we've got, you know, we've had, we have lots of solar bylaws and you've seen some of them. We've sent some of them to you already. Um, these seemed like reasonably good examples. Palmer's is relatively strict and um, provides a lot of limitations. Hadley's is a little bit looser. Um, and we know that Hadley has several solar installations in, uh, in place. Um, so we thought those were, you know, good examples to start out with. But I wanted to talk about Palmer's um, example. And this one was sent to me uh, by a member of the public. I can't remember who it was. And um, the person who sent it to me thought it was a good example. So, you know, I think it's, it's well written. It's well organized. It's got a lot of um, good information in it. It's um, also 
as I said, fairly strict. So um, I put together some, some thoughts about the bylaw and maybe Pam can bring it up on the screen and um, we'll post it yes. on, uh, on the planning board you know, packet um, probably mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. some of the things that I noticed about the Hallmer's bylaw were, um, well, we'll go through them one by one. Um, so one of them is um, the extent of solar array. And um, the question in my mind is, should Amherst impose a limit on the extent or size of a solar array? Um, so just to let you know, the array that uh, Amherst has proposed or that a, develop, a solar developer has proposed for the Hickory Ridge site in South Amherst is 26.4 acres. And that's part of a 150 acre site. So that's one of the several uses that are going to be um, proposed for Hickory Ridge. Hey, Chris, so, yeah? can, can I interrupt just to ask Pam, could you do a one page view and, and make it <laughs> A, a substantially yeah. a, a substantial part of the width of the screen. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that right. way everyone so, can read it. Yeah. So, and this is a question that I don't know the answer to. Should Amherst impose a limit on the extent of a solar array? So Hadley has a limit of 10 acres. Um, we know that Pelham and Shutesbury have limits of 15 acres and Belchertown has a limit of 20 acres. Um, I think Amherst should be cautious about imposing a limit on the size of a solar array. Um, and I think that it's really related to, you know, the size of the site that's being proposed and how suitable that site is. One thing I know from, you know, just kind of generally talking about this topic is that there probably aren't that many really suitable sites in Amherst. And if we find a suitable site, um, it may not be the best um, what uh, decision to limit the size of a solar array on a site that is particularly appropriate for solar. Um, we may want to limit the amount of clearing of forested areas, and we may want to limit the amount of development of prime agricultural land, but to put a blanket size limit on an array may not be useful. Um, especially since we're trying to reach the town goal of combating climate change and um, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions substantially by 2050. So I don't know if people want to talk about this particular topic. It might be useful to hear what people have to say. And, and like I said in the beginning of what I'm, you know, my presentation is that I'm learning about this now. I'm, you know, I, I'm coming at this with an open mind. I don't have a point of view, but I think, you know, we're all going to learn about it. We're all going to teach each other. And hopefully by the end, we'll have a product that is at least acceptable to most people in town. So. All right. Thanks for that introduction on, on this particular aspect. Andrew, I see your hand. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Um, I, I think I agree with you, Chris. One thing that popped in my mind is, you know, could the developer just subdivide their parcel to sort of work around any type of cap anyway, if, um, you know, assuming that site is equal to parcel in, in the language here. Um, so that was that was one thing that popped in my mind. And also I think that you, you mentioned something which I think is of critical importance as we consider this is that, especially in a, in a site that's this large, there's gonna be, there's gonna be variable suitability across the site as well. Um, so I think the, no, the notion of, of having kind of a one size fits all or a cap um, may not be adequately responsible or um, representative of the conditions in that particular site. I think this, I think it'd be interesting to take a look at this once the suitability work comes back. And I'm curious whether that suitability work would actually be of a, a fine enough grain where we'd be able to you know, allocate portions of parcels as suitable or not, or whether the intent is going to just be like a, a, a Boolean kind of yes, no, you're good or you're bad. So those would be my thoughts on this first one. All right, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I, I was also struck when I saw the map of the Hickory Ridge solar array in our packet and just how sort of much interruption there was in, in how irregularly shaped they were 
uh, because of the site constraints. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have comments uh, on this? Janet. So I thought this was something that um, we, you know, we could get guidance from the um, Solar Resource Assessment bylaw and bylaw committee um, because there's a lot of different paths to choose. And I, I had the same thought as Andrew that, you know, someone could break up their parcel and, you know, put in, you know, seven, five acre things instead of just having a large facility. And I would sort of defer this question, you know, because there's going to be different impacts and consequences and benefits. I also wondered why did the towns pick the, 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 the acreage that they did. And I just wonder if that could be some phone calls to Palmer and Belchertown planning department and just say, you know, is there a, is there a factual basis or re, is some evidence behind the site size over another? Like I just, to me, it was just, I don't wanna be picking numbers out of the air, but they obviously did pick numbers. And I wondered how did they get, you know, what was the information that led them to that number? Janet, is that something you would be interested to make those calls? I could do that. I'm, I'm always happy to chat on the phone. Yeah, we've had, we've had, we've also had the one individual who's come to a couple of our hearings, who I think is from Shutesbury and has indicated that he was part of putting together the Shutesbury bylaw. I don't remember his name, but I think it was Michael D. Chiara. Yeah, that's that's kind of yeah. what was in my head too. Yeah, I wouldn't mind doing that. You know, right. I, just, I just thought, how did you get there? You know. Yeah. Well, I think it's worth asking. All right, thanks. Um, Tom. Hey, thanks, Doug. I just wanted to comment that I, I felt like I, I read here or somewhere, and I just read a lot of things in the last 48 hours, but um, that talked about um, the limit size limitation being a derivative of the actual size of the property rather than you know, a finite size in and of itself. So instead of capping it at 10 acres, if we have a property that's much larger, that that could have, uh, you know, a larger array or um, sm multiple smaller arrays on a larger property or something like that. So, so I'd be more in favor of looking at um, something that's scalable and sort of a max proportion or something to that effect rather than a finite size. Um, and it goes along with, you know, area, the cleared area, and it goes along with open space that's there, which is a percentage or 1.5 times um, the solar array. So I, I think there are ways to, to think about it as a proportion that's scalable. Okay, great. Um, I guess I'll mention a couple of things that were on my mind. One is... Uh, I was thinking about whether, you know, for a given size of solar array, is it better to have one large contiguous place where all of it happens or a lots of little places? Like, you know, like with the Swiss cheese, do you want one big bubble or do you want lots of little ones? And I found a guy at the Harvard Forest Leadership, you know, forest fragmentation, that fragmentation, and that the, the, the scientific, there wasn't a consensus yet on which way was preferable. But he, but he also said that if he had to guess, you know, because every one of these things has to have a road to it and has to have, a, you know, some measure of, uh, you know, setbacks and, and fencing. Um, that his guess is that it's probably better to have fewer larger arrays than to have lots and lots of little ones, just in terms of a forest. And, and obviously that's a comparison if you end up with the same, you know, if you're comparing a certain number of acres in one place to the same number of acres in another place. Um, whereas if, you know, if you say, well, we're not going to limit the size and we're going to allow big things, you know, the practical result might be you have a lot more big things and a lot more acreage of solar arrays in your town. So, um, that's just one, one piece of, uh, I think that's, that's an, uh, part of this conversation. Johanna. 
Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm inclined to, like Chris, I appreciate your thinking about this. And I think I also kind of echo the caution sentiment because I think you could have, yeah, the unintended consequence of essentially less solar, but just as much disruption of open space, um, if not potentially more through the fragmentation of it. So, um, and you know, we want like, we need a lot of solar. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think this is the, I, I'm appreciating the conversation and I appreciate, you know, what, what folks have said. And I think we wanna be, if we pick a size limit, we'd wanna have a really clear reason why that's chosen and have it be grounded in our solar study rather than just a kind of a number picked out of the hat. Okay. Um, one other thing that occurred to me, and I think it was brought up, well, I, I don't remember who brought it up. Um, if you're a landowner and you have some woods in a residential that are zoned residential, you could clear cut it and put in a subdivision. Now, and I don't know whether you'd make more money than if you put in a solar array on a substantial portion of your land. So, you know, the, the, by limiting solar, I wonder sometimes whether we are inadvertently making development of the land the more attractive option um, for, you know, people that own land in residential areas. So, um, does anybody have any other thoughts for this particular topic? All right, Chris, uh, did that give you some initial, or you know, gave you what you got? It gave yep. it gave you what you got. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah. I wanted to start the conversation, so this is really good. Okay. Okay. Now we'll go to the second um, second one which is the extent of forest land clearing. So if Pam can um, scroll down a bit, yep. So um, I've been talking to Stephanie Ciccarello, the sustainability coordinator about this. And um, we, Amherst will need to make a decision about whether it wants to uh, have a limitation on the extent of forest clearing. Um, and Belchertown actually does have a limitation. They say no more than 10 acres of land, of forested land can be cleared. Um, and so my conversation with Stephanie had to do with, well, some forested land is very valuable for its habitat or other environmental values. And some forested land is less valuable either because it's, you know, sort of a, scrubby meadow that's grown up into a forest recently or you know it doesn't have very good soil or isn't part of a, you know doesn't have a lot of water stormwater recharge or whatever the reason is there are differences in in the value of forests whatever your criteria are so the solar uh the person the consultant that's helping us with the solar site assessment um and we're hoping to have a forest ecologist as part of the committee. Um, so we're hoping to get a handle on, is there um, a difference between one type of forest and another where with the first type of forest, you may not be as concerned about having it be cleared. And the second type of forest, you would be very concerned about having it cleared. So we're hoping that we can get an answer to that question, but in, in the end, Amherst is going to have to make a decision. Do we want to put a limit on the amount of forest that's cleared? And do we want to, that limit to be tied to, you know, the value, the quote value? I don't know enough about this to determine what the value is, but, you know, related to the value, do we want to have a limit on uh, clearing? So um, if people want to talk about that, I'd be interested in hearing about that. Well, let's see, Tom, I see your hand. Thanks, Doug, and thanks, Chris. I, I, I guess my question about this has a little bit to do with um, whether this belongs in a solar bylaw or whether this belongs in a general bylaw, in the sense that 
why are we talking about this for this sake, but not in case someone wants to put like a go-kart track or if they want to put a pig farm in their backyard or they just want a rolling landscape and they want to clear, like what, why is this something that we're limiting only to solar and not something we're thinking about as something we are concerned about um, protecting our forests or we're concerned about protecting habitats. It should be a kind of universal uh, bylaw, I believe. And I think that goes for some of the other comments I might have about things going forward um, that seem like we're nitpicking solar, but we're not thinking about these as broader um, issues that affect that are affected by a lot of other kinds of changes to our land. All right, thanks, Tom. Andrew, you get yours with the next hand. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I think that's that's actually a great call out, Tom. I hadn't thought about that, and I, I would agree. I think it, it makes sense to think of this in terms of a broader context. <coughs> to me. Um, I, just like a couple of musings, like I would definitely want to force ecologists if we're going to try to make an assessment as to value, because I think that you could probably have, you know, 10 different opinions on what constitutes valuable habitat and what doesn't. Um, so I, I'd feel uncomfortable at this point making a declaration, certainly one expert opinion on that. Um, and then ultimately, I think like I would have a clear picture of this based on the suitability analysis, right? If, if all of our four, like, if every like gently sloping southern facing property, and yeah, I'm not even sure that that's what you want, but if that's like the ideal scenario for solar, I'd want to understand whether those are all forested lands because um, it would probably change how I would think about this, um, you know, in terms of what the potential full build out scenario might look like. So, thanks. All right, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Janet, you're next. So I, I think this is an, this is, I think at, at the end of the day, it would be sort of a community value on the land, not just the forester's value, or I guess a forest ecologist is broader. And cause I, I looked at that word value and I thought what's high value, what's low in like, what are the factors, recreation, oxygen production, carbon uptake and storage, wildlife, you know, maybe there's a lot of wetlands in there, water supply, hunting, you know, it's, it, the land, forests have lots of values to them. And so, um, and then if you're limiting um, the size of cuts or how much can, you know, like it's, it does seem like you need to sort of step back and say, okay, this is our forest land. Should it be protected? What should we do with it? I mean, I think we should have done this a while ago and it gets to Tom's point of, you know, if, if you know, why should this just be about a solar site? You know, it could be a go-kart track or it could just be a, the landowner can go in and very heavily cut um, and then it becomes a degraded forest and maybe then it's suitable for, for you know, for um, solar or other facilities. And so I was kind of concerned about that might be, you know, there'd be an incentive to cut and change habitat or there's no real controls of how forest land is handled here. Um, so I think that's another great thing to kick to the, the resource committee, like picking sites and why we pick sites. And that it, I think it ultimately is sort of a community decision of what the values are. Um, and then I, you know, again, you can have the checkerboard effect about habitat. And so, you know, um, or the Swiss cheese effect and that if you're, if you're cutting different sites or putting in go-karts or solar facilities, you're changing the animals and the plants that will be there and how animals move through that whole environment. And so it's, anyway, that's it. All right. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Janet. Um, I'm going to just make one comment kind of in response to uh, where you mentioned uh, picking sites. And um, that seems very prescriptive to me. In, uh, and so I, I guess, I think there's gonna be a sort of fundamental approach conversation or there should be about whether we're actually saying where it should be, or are we saying simply it can be anywhere except some particularly critical places. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's a pretty fundamental decision. And um, it also reminds me of that amicus brief that we received from you, Chris, that uh, I think it was Michael Pill had, had sent for the Waltham uh, lawsuit, 
And, um, you know, his, obviously his argument is under current law, it can really happen anywhere. And um, so, you know, if we come into this with putting a lot of effort into a bylaw that is very restrictive uh, and, you know, the courts say you really can't do that, we will have sort of wasted some effort and, um, you know, maybe put ourselves open to a lawsuit if, uh, if that's the way the judicial decisions are going. All right, uh, Johanna. Thanks. Um, I think back to, I think when we first started talking about the solar moratorium, I asked a bunch of questions like how much forest does Amherst have and how much of it is developable? Um, and for me, those are like questions that we need answers to. Cause if we have a bunch of protected forest, then I might be totally fine not putting a limitation on private forests that can be cleared for solar. But if we, if most of our forests could be developed, then it might make sense to put a uh, restriction on it. So I just need more information. Yeah, that parallels something I had written down, which had to do with, you know, how much of our forest is in town conservation land already. And then that begs the question of, is the town open to using some of that for solar? Or are we gonna limit solar only where there's private land? Um, so good point, Johanna. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. I, uh, another question, maybe this had come up in a previous meeting, but um, well, I know in a previous meeting, there's some, some talk about, you know, what Amherst's share of the state goal would be. Um, and, you know, is it appropriate to, to think in those units, right? Like. Um, maybe we could do it, but maybe you could get much better production, much more suitable lands out of a different um, area. So I was, I was just wondering whether anyone was aware, Chris, maybe as you looked at these, um, are other towns trying to solve this sort of on their own for their quote share? Or is there, is there possible, possible, are there possibility to like partner with other communities to try to, um, to, to share the burden in a more sensible, broader view. It just, uh, you know, I, I, it's, I, I get a little nervous that, that um, us trying to do our share, which is very noble, might, might result in kind of substandard or inferior actual installations when it's, when it's done. Not knowing a ton about the technology, to be honest, but um, are other towns approaching it kind of as a, this is their job to solve entirely? You want well, me to answer that, Doug? Yeah, sure, Chris. So um, Cape Cod, Cape Cod Commission has <coughs> put forth a solar model, solar bylaw to help towns on the Cape to, you know, address this issue. Um, I don't think they've necessarily gotten together, but they have this model solar bylaw that's been prepared for the Cape that the towns can use. And you know, we have our Pioneer Valley Planning Commission guidelines as far as, um, you know, developing a solar bylaw. I'm sorry, there's a, somebody vacuuming upstairs. But anyway. Um, we, we can't hear the vacuum, Chris. Oh, good. Okay. So the answer is not really. They haven't really been getting together to deal with this um, in concert, which doesn't mean that we can't do that. Um, some of our neighboring towns already have solar bylaws, Shootsbury, Pelham, and Hadley, but, and Belchertown. But, you know, we could reach out to them and say, do you want to try to do this together? I think that's probably a larger, longer term conversation. And probably we're not going to be able to have that conversation before we feel mm, like we need to put a, a solar bylaw in place. But in terms of what is our share, you know, I think that's probably a good question to ask um, and to be solved regionally rather than you know town by town well it's it's it is true that Amherst has something like 40,000 people and most of those surrounding towns are much smaller so if you want to think in that terms regionally you know our share may actually be the majority of 
the power demand in, in for us in the surrounding towns. Um, and I guess I, I guess I get a little nervous when people talk about our share because it feels like everybody's trying to do only as much as they have to. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, first of all, that feels like, you know, not very uh, welcoming <laughs> among other things. But, um, you know, when you, when you get to uh, the statewide situation, there's a whole lot of people in the Eastern part of the state who don't really have available land for solar and maybe they're all gonna get their power from wind. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure whether le the legislature would want the towns out in this part of the state saying we're only gonna do our share. So, Janet. So, on the good news front, which is so rare, um, the Boston Globe had an article today that saying that Massachusetts had hit its 25% reduction goal. And I'm not sure if that's like a firm number. Um, part of it may have been due to the pandemic, but mostly it's from the conversion to natural gas away from oil. And so there is progress being made. And so I think we should, and, it, and you know, it's obviously, you know, it's not every town doing like 25% reductions. And so I, I do think it's a it is a question about like how much do we need how much solar do we need where do we get our energy from I'm not sure it all has to take place in the borders of Amherst but Chris I have a question for you because I've been sort of following this is Amherst looking at I you know I remember from Darcy Dumont talking about community choice aggregation which is a kind of towns banding together to buy energy. And it's not necessarily energy within their borders. It's like an energy that's available and it, you know, they can buy green energy and it turns out to be cheaper than what you're buying. You know, I buy from, you know, I actually am on propane, but you know, it's cheaper because you're buying in bulk. Is that, is, is the town moving towards that? I thought they were gonna work with Northampton and Hadley. And so does that affect our calculus of what's our share from solar? Doug, may I answer yeah, that? Yeah, sure, Chris. Yes, Stephanie Ciccarello is working on that, um, and she is uh, working very hard with other communities to establish community aggregated um, energy program. Um, I'm not sure what the timeline on that is, um, but I could find out from her. Um, but that's certainly something that is being worked on. Okay. Uh, Maria, you're next. Uh, um... So I, I am not a solar expert, so I'm coming at it from like um, sort of the regulation side and I'm thinking through like planning board roles and private property owner rights. And so mm -hmm. I guess what I'm having a weird time with this, all of this is, um, okay, so we're talking about people's private property that we're putting this new layer of regulation on. And um, like, for example, site plan reviews and special permits, we look at like whether the proposed projects are a detriment to like the butters, whether they, um, you know, are light or noise pollution. So for this, we're looking at sort of, uh, we're putting on this extra layer, you know, of like we're folding in the environment. In this. We're like, is this a detriment to the environment? And it's, it's interesting because every site is different, as we know from all these permits we've reviewed and to put in number of limits on all these things same, seems very strange to me. And then also these values of like, you know, significant or important or um, critical. It all seems so, I don't know. I feel like it needs to be something similar to how we approach it with like special permits and, and site plan reviews where we look at the parcels, we look at um, the adjacencies, we look at what's the parcel as far as like what's not buildable and uh, how much square footage it is overall, what's it next to, what zone is it in. So I feel like there's not like a blanket answer. It seems like every project like we know is going to be different. So I guess what I'm trying to lean toward is um, we really should have these committees with these various experts and, and uh, perspectives that have actual facts to get into the things we're talking about. Um, I guess what we should be doing is really just come up with a question, right? To ask 
but that we're not really going to come up with uh, sort of direction or answers. But I, I just, I'm kind of, you know, like the the letter from Michael Pill, just sort of the, um, you know, what is a private property owner's rights? And uh, uh, for us to define them, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm just, what, I, what I'm having difficulty with is also that the end result is, you know, solar energy, which is such a necessity in our sort of existence and um, and we're trying to limit it and control it and say what's not allowed. And um, so I just feel really torn about like putting all these um, really restrictive things, but at the same time, yeah, we kind of like site plan reviews and special permits. We need to be careful about, you know, how it impacts um, its environment and maybe the bigger picture. So, you know, I, I don't know the answers to any of uh, the things you're asking, Chris, but I, I certainly appreciate us going through like the questions we should be asking. But um, my, my view is that um, we should be really careful about um, limitations and, and saying, you know, this many acres, this many feet. I feel like we really um, need to realize that uh, the, the types of projects that do large PV or, um, installs, installations are usually huge tracks and so putting numbers seems very um, I think Tom touched on this you know it doesn't make sense to say a specific number um, it should be more about like oh uh, like the FAR kind of thing you know where you take a proportion of each parcel and you do percentages but um I guess I yeah I, I'm kind of this is not my realm I, I don't know how to really insert uh information other than just um feelings and thoughts <laughs> at this point but I do look forward to getting more sort of expert um, information and data and to help us move ahead. But, um, but yeah, I just, my, I'm kind of in the sort of side of like, don't put so many numbers and restrictions so that it becomes such an unwieldy process that Amherst is like to, P, to PV developers, like, oh, stay out of Amherst. You know, I, I definitely don't want that to happen. So I guess that's my contribution. <laughs> okay, thanks, Maria. Chris, you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I should have said this earlier, that one of the things that we're hoping that the um, consultant will help us do is to establish community values. Like, what do we value? Do we value forests? Do we value wetlands? Do we value having alternative energy sources? Do we, you know, what, what are the community's values that we should reflect in our bylaw? and coming to some sort of agreement about that, because I think right now there really isn't much agreement about it and having that discussion out in the open. Um, and we're gonna hear from a lot of different people with a lot of different points of view. And um, we're hoping that that is, you know, that helps us to make our choices and make our decisions about these things. So that would be a series of public meetings or a town-wide survey or could you know, be both. Any of any of those, huh? Yep. Okay. Um, not seeing any more board hands. I'm just going to mention a couple of things that I was thinking about um, with respect to the extent of forest land clearing. Um, and the first first thing I think I've mentioned before in a previous meeting, which is you know, if you're a landowner, there's nothing prohibiting you right now from cutting down pretty much all of the trees on your land, except where there may be wetlands or water conservation commission uh, jurisdiction. So, you know, if we're going to be, we we may uh, if we if we put a restriction on this for solar arrays, we may create a sort of undesirable incentive for somebody who's thinking, well, maybe I'll do one in five years. I'll put a, so, a lot of solar panels there, but I'll, I'll cut my trees down now so that, uh, you know, I'm not cutting forest when I go and look for my solar permit. And um, so I think the timeline is something you'd want to talk, think about and whether we need to say, you know, if you cut your if you cut your all your trees down less than two years ago, we're going to count them as though they were there, or something like that. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, 
you know, there, I don't know what the number is, uh, but there are transmission losses in electrical systems from the distance that you have to run the electricity in wires to get to the wherever the demand is. And so I think as electricity gets more expensive because we're going to be doing it sustainably, we may want to really, really be doing our share uh, and doing our share as close to the demand as we can, um, which may mean, you know, we don't really want to do it in the outlying forests. We want to do it kind of near to where people are. So I think last time I mentioned, gee, maybe every 25 houses in a subdivision should, that parcel should be solar. Um, so I hope we're not just going to be thinking about forest land or farmland. Uh, okay, Johanna. It's funny because as we're talking about the solar bylaw, it's so much of it is focused on these utility scale solar projects. And we're not, you know, we're not having kind of a comprehensive conversation about how do we maximize rooftop solar and how do we incentivize solar on the built environment? Um, and how do we encourage community solar projects where, you know, essentially rather than you, you know, developers owning the solar panels, you create financing for neighbors to, you know, community members to actually own the solar and get the benefits of, you know, the lower bills from that. So I don't quite know where that conversation happens or, you know, whether that's part of the solar bylaw conversation or whether that's a different conversation that town council does but i it strikes me as being important okay thanks johanna janet um i was just going to say before johanna was what about incentives to encourage behavior or actions that we want and it'd be interesting to me like what other communities have done to, you know, encourage solar where they want it. And that could be, um, you know, tax breaks. It could be, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of different things in that. That would be great to know because it, it does seem like we're really being, you know, obviously if you're limiting, it'd be nice to like encourage people to do the behavior you want. And um, what are some things that we could put? It could be, it may not belong in a zoning bylaw. It might just be belong in the regular bylaw. So I wonder okay. if they All right, well, it's, I mean, the tools that Amherst has, I mean, the first one that comes to mind is the property tax structure. You know, you could get a, an abatement on some of your property tax if you have some number of megawatts of solar or something. Um, but that implies that those who don't have solar are probably gonna see their bill go up a little bit more just so that the town doesn't lose revenue over in the in the in the overall. All right, Chris, is that probably a good? Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Go ahead. I thought maybe we were done with forest land clearing, but go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to follow up on the incentive question. Like, I mean, I, I I understand why we would want to incentivize this, but I also think we have to think about who has access to to doing this kind of um, these kinds of updates and uh, whether we're incentivizing the same people who already are being incentivized and not thinking about people who don't have access to such things. So <clears throat> I think we should be cautious across the board about things like that, especially when it comes to these kinds of investments. That's yeah, all. Tom, you're, you're reminding me, I, I listened to a, it was some sort of TED talk style presentation that was on the UMass Amherst Clean Energy Extension website that Erin Baker, the engineering professor, had done. And she was talking about the fact that any solar incentive is probably going to be utilized first by somebody who owns their house. Yep. And secondly, somebody who's got the cash to outlay in order to participate, you know, to, to get it built and then participate in the rebates that you get yep. on your electric bill. Yeah. And that that's not very equitable 
for mm -hmm. the people who don't have enough capital to own their house or, you know, put out a big chunk of change to put solar on their roof. Absolutely. And then and then wealth begets wealth because that just continues to save them money over a long period of time. Um, right. You know, so it's it's problematic in a lot of different ways when we think about those incentives for sure. So anyway, it's just something we should be cognizant of as we have these conversations. Right. Well, I mean, we are we are talking about how we're going to get our energy not from the uh, you know fossil fuel burning plant in Holyoke uh, in the low income neighborhood with lots of particulates in the air. Uh, instead, we're going to need to do it here in town. Yeah. All right. So, Chris, maybe we should go on to the third uh, topic. Do you want to yeah. introduce that? So the third topic is. Um solar on prime agricultural soils. So Palmer um, has a prohibition on having solar installations on prime agricultural soils unless they are dual use. And in, in other words, unless they have the solar arrays and also farming, whatever format that takes, you know, animals grazing or raising crops or whatever. Um, so the question is, does Amherst, is Amherst interested in this kind of restriction or this kind of limitation? Um, and in general, I guess, you know, how does Amherst feel about putting solar on prime agricultural soils? So I just wanted to say something that I, I think I understand, maybe I don't because I'm just learning. But I think I understand that most of these um, arrays don't really, um, you know, they don't chew up the land. They are an array on a post and you shove the post in the ground and you connect the post to other posts and then you connected them to some, you know, to an inter to a net network. Um, but my point is that they don't um, have a negative impact on the soil unless the soil gets eroded or removed as part of the project. But it's not necessary in most cases to remove the soil in order to install these solar arrays. So I think that should be part of this conversation about, you know, does Amherst want to restrict, prohibit um, installation of solar arrays on prime agricultural soils? Um, if so, would Amherst be willing to, you know, engage in having a dual use? Is that a better thing to do? So um, let's have a conversation about that. All right. Well, nobody else is jumping in. I, I guess the first thing I would want to know, and I hope our solar study will somehow tell us this or pass along, do we, how many, how much solar, how much prime agricultural land do we really have? Um, and, um, you know, because we're certainly not Hadley. Um, so, Tom? So I'm just going to chime back in about um, the bigger picture stuff and whether this belongs in a solar specific um, uh, set of values we have, or is this a general value we have? Because there's lots of things that we can put on prime agricultural soil, like monocrops that might damage them and create uh, runoff or toxins or destroy habitats or things like that. And we don't, what, what is our bylaw that protects that land in that case and not so much just in the solar case? So this is one of those many things I feel like is Part of a larger thing we want to talk about do we want to protect these lands if so this should be something that we don't talk about in relationship to solar we just talk about it as a principle or a value that we have as a community okay thanks tom uh janet so i think one of the positive things that will come out of the solar assessment is sort of answering that question um it doesn't make sense to say you can't put solar on prime agricultural soils or soils of statewide concern or importance, and then put a housing development on it, you know? And I think this sort of goes back to the master plan where we are supposed to be inventorying our resources, our natural resources, which would include our farmland and deciding what goes where. And um, 
you know, you know, when you set up a zoning district and you say residences, that means you're not putting in, you know, factories. And when you, if you set up a zoning district and you say farmland, that means you're not putting in factories on that farmland. And so I think the consequence or the result of this is always going to be going back to that question, Tom, about like, where should, where should things go? And, you know, if you protect the forest from solar, but it winds up being a subdivision or a go-kart or a pickleball court, you know, a set of pickleball courts, what have you really achieved, you know? And so I think we might wind up, you know, with a different zoning plan or changes in districts or overlays that we didn't expect. I think, but I think these are good questions to ask. We have to ask them and we have to find the information. Okay, Tom. Thanks, yeah, and, and um, thanks, Janet, for following up. I mean, I just wanna be clear that I'm not against these as ideas. I'm, I'm like, I like the idea of conserving forests and, and prime agricultural land. I just wanna be clear that I don't think it necessarily needs to be nested specifically for solar. And so I think we wanna think about these things and you know, maybe if we do talk later about our, our zoning priorities, maybe these become zoning priorities to talk about the bigger picture rather than um, the sort of micro bullet points within our solar bylaw. Thanks. Good. Okay, any other hands for this one? Janet. I do wanna make a big pitch for farmland. Um, especially where we live, because we live in an area with really amazing soils. And that I think it's going to be a key sustainability thing to have local food production. Um, you know, our, our national agricultural system is based on fossil fuels and long transport and, you know, losing 40% of the food by the time it arrives in your grocery store, where but a bunch gets, you know, thrown out then. And so I think these soils are really precious. And I, I, I kind of rue not just the solar arrays, but, you know, a lot of the development has taken place already on prime soil. So I think we should conserve those for ourselves. And I think it's going to be a very critical sustainability strategy as the years go by. All right. So maybe Amherst needs to add more farmland to its conservation land and put its money where its mouth might be. All right. Um, Johanna. I'm sorry, I don't mean to prolong this, but I keep thinking about the town-owned conservation land that is Wentworth Farm, which is kind of behind our, you know, it's kind of the conservation area that I'm most familiar with. And just this morning, as my husband and I were talking about solar, he was like, what do you think about putting solar there? And, um, it, you know, it's funny because technically that is still farmable land like a farmer could lease that land from the town and but they haven't gotten any bids for years and years and years i think maybe because of a combination of the restrictions that are on the land and you know the fields are relatively small and kind of cumbersome to manage so um i don't know it's you know it's funny because I feel like there might be prime agricultural soils now that are not currently being farmed because it's restrictive for some other reason. And solar might be the best use for the next 20 to 25 years. Um, so I don't know, I would be got, you know, I would kind of take our cues from the solar study. And if we want to pursue the protection of prime agricultural soils, it seems like something that would be in the general bylaw rather than the solar bylaw. Those are my two cents. Okay. Uh, I'll take down your hand. Um, Chris, is that a reasonable start on the it's third good. topic? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, accessory uses. Yeah, so the next one relates to accessory uses. Do we want to um, control accessory uses. For instance, Hampshire College has um, eight acres of a 20 acre parcel down on Bay Road um, that provides the college campus with um, energy. And they don't sell the energy to anybody else. They just use it for um, the college. And is there any reason why we would want to 
limit the size of an accessory use if it provides power to a particular landowner. And, um, you know, that could be a farm. Sometimes farms have solar uh, arrays that provide power to their, you know, their operations. Um, so this is, you know, something that came up in my reading about, um, about solar. And I believe that, I don't, I don't have an exact quotation, but I believe that uh, Palmer does um, talk about accessory uses in its solar bylaw, but I don't, as, as I said, I can't remember exactly the, the context. So is there any interest in um, limiting the size of accessory uses? Well, it, it seems to me that if we, if we're going to put a bunch of restrictions on how someone can configure a solar array on their land, shouldn't it apply equally to everyone? I well, that's mean, my question. We're, we're all question. we're all part of the electric grid, so whether Hampshire captures those electrons before they leave the you know their property, or whether those electrons go out and come back to my house. I don't know if I'm not, I mean, seems like it kind of begs the question. Andrew. I would second that. And that was my same thought. I mean, if you drive down the street, you don't know where that particular energy is going uh, when you see the array. So I'm in a similar space as you on this one. Well, it could also uh, create an incentive. If you've got 50 acres, you, you find what, is you, what it is that you can put on it that would need all the solar that you want to put on it. <laughs> sort of work backwards. Johanna. Thanks. I can't tell if I am, it's possible that I'm just not totally understanding the accessory use thing, but I think what I, I know that there are instances where there are, let's say structures like warehouses that use relatively little energy compared to their solar potential on the warehouse roof. And local rules literally don't allow them to maximize the rooftop solar potential because the energy usage of the building underneath it, like they're only allowed to build as much solar as they can use on site. And I think that's perverse. Like we should be maximizing that entire rooftop. And so it's possible that, that you know, that wouldn't be considered a accessory use and that we would come at that more through a community solar project where other people in town could then use the energy from those solar panels. But, um, I would just want to make sure we don't put anything in place that restricts us from like if somebody wants to put solar somewhere but for some reason they wouldn't be able to because we have limited it okay um chris if we're going to be doing an overlay wouldn't this be an overlay over every you know, all of the different type district types that we have, um, including educational. Um, you know, I mean, we haven't really talked about the details of how the different restrictions might apply, but we could have, you know, we could treat it differently in the educational zone from the residential zone or from the commercial zone. And would that be, a, I mean, that might be a way to be more responsive or, or, you know, more appropriate for the different types of uses that would be on the land that would be potentially accessorized with solar panels. So um, it, Hampshire College's solar array is not in their educational zone. It's on, I think it's on RO, which is why the planning board got involved. If it were in the educational zone, um, the planning board would not have gotten involved in permitting, in permitting it. So that's another question. Do we want to have any control over um, the institutional lands that are in the educational district, which there's quite a lot of uh, land that Amherst College, Hampshire College, and UMass own. 
of course, UMass doesn't come under our zoning regulations, but the colleges have a lot of land in the educational district. And do we want them to be part of this solar study? Um, and then do we want to be able to regulate what they do with their land as far as solar goes? And that's not a question here on this list, but it's a question for um, the planning board and everybody to think about. Maria. My sense is no, we don't do any, we don't have any purview over ED with their buildings and their structures or parking or anything. So why would solar suddenly be included in that? Uh, is there precedence for that happening where solar suddenly is treated differently and what is a zone that normally wouldn't have it, you know, be regulated by a town suddenly is regulated? Chris? So there's nothing that says we couldn't regulate things in the ED district. You would just need to change the zoning bylaw to include um, regulation of solar in the ED district. It's up to the town to do that. Um, in the past, we've never regulated anything in the ED district except things within 50 feet of, a, of the, you know, edge of the district, but um, the town could choose to regulate these things if it wanted to. Okay. Well, I guess that's just a start of the conversation. Do we move on to the minimum size? Sure. So Palmer has um, imposed a minimum of five acres for um, property in rural residential areas that can be developed for solar and a minimum of 30 acres with a frontage of at least 250 feet in their general business areas. I haven't looked at their zoning maps, so I don't know the extent of these two districts, but is there any reason why Amherst would want to impose a minimum um, acreage on solar arrays. And to me, it seems a little bit, um, what, I don't know, not logical because large scale solar arrays start at one acre. So wouldn't you want to be able to, if it were possible to have small one acre solar arrays here and there around town, if there were appropriate land available? Um, so the question is, is there any reason that you all can think of as to why Amherst might want to impose a minimum size of a property um, for installing solar arrays? Andrew. Thanks, Doug. I may have misread this. I thought this was saying that they're like capping how big it could be. No. When they say limit to five, so it's a minimum of five, not a maximum. Minimum of five acres in the rural residential area. Yeah. Okay. No, I, 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 I would agree with you. I, I, well, I'll say this, not an expert. I, the five doesn't really mean anything to me, but it does seem like, um, to the extent, and I know many have said on the phone already, if we can get the power from somewhere, then we should be open to it. And if it's four point nine nine, that shouldn't preclude someone from being able to pursue it in my mind. Well, this might be another question that Janet can ask to, to Palmer. How, how did you come up with this, these numbers? Hey, Janet, you've got your hand up. I know you're taking a note there. I'm, I'm just I'm just like, thanks, Doug. <laughs> 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 I think I need a bigger piece of paper. Um, I, I think, I think um, I was a little confused by this. I think this means like minimum lot size. So you need a five acre parcel before you can put any large scale array, which is like a one acre thing. And um, I don't know what the zone is, the rural residential area. Like it might be a zone where you have to have a three acre lot to build a house kind of like, is it RO or um, RLD? We have zoning like that in this town. And I think it would, I think the maybe what they're getting at is, you know, if you lived in a residential neighborhood and the minimum lot size is, I don't know, like a quarter acre or a third acre, somebody who has two acres of land in a residential zone can suddenly put in a two acre 
um, solar array or, you know, maybe an acre and a half with some setbacks. And so I think, I think that goes into the disturbing thing next door category and um, of like, can you imagine what it'd be like to live next to a, you know, three or five acre solar facility in your neighborhood that was zoned for basically housing, you know, and it could be duplexes or multiplexes, but, you know, you know, down in, you know, around town or in, you know, and so I think we do zone all the time with minimum lot sizes, light size to create buffers for um, farmland, you know, buffers for scenic areas, buffers for, um, you know, the rivers and things like that. And we're trying to create neighbor, like zones of small residences um, or, you know, residences around the village center. And so think about if we don't have a minimum lot size for different districts, what could that look like? And you know, even in RG, people own one or two acres or a developer could buy up a few lots and put in just a really large solar array. And that visual kind of cue or shock, I think would be kind of, we should think about that impact on the town and how it looks. And that sounds all sort of very elitist, but it's kind of the essence of zoning districts anyway, is like the look, the feel of the neighborhood um, or the protection of resources nearby. I live on the fringe of those kind of zoning things. All right, thanks, Janet. Tom. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, I think some of um, what um, Janet's saying, I would tend to agree with. I mean, I, I do see a need to think about the impact it has in certain zones. So I think, you know, maybe this isn't like a universal A or B, um, as we see in the, um, the Palmer one, where we're seeing rural and then general business, you know, there might be different um, values for different um, zones that we have. But I, I think um, a lot of what we also see is a minimum lot size um, being, or what might work as a minimum lot size in relationship to uh, the proportion of the installation itself. So whether that's you know, if I have a one acre installation, I have to have a three acre property. If I have a three acre installation, I have to have a nine acre property or whatever that is that, um, you know, that's where I think the open space or some of these other setbacks or other things might help limit that size uh, of the um, uh, the array, not, not some, or, you know, based on the property itself. So the property here, we have minimum size, um, minimum size to determine how big a piece of uh, solar array you could put there. So that would just be a thought about proportion. Yeah, this reminds me of a couple of the bylaws that said if you clear or if your solar array is one acre, you need to put in reserve four times that much land in sort of permanent reserve as woodland during the life of the project. So that yeah. would that would turn into a five acre, you know, parcel yeah. if you do one acre. Um, yeah. So, you know, it seems like it's related to the sort of set aside requirements that we've seen in some of these bylaws. Yeah, totally. And some of the open space ones as well. Yeah. I guess my sort of at least at the moment, I, I don't see why we would want to have a minimum size, uh, but I may I may learn why that I would think that would be a good idea. Tom, is your hand still up? Okay, I'll drop you. Um, any other hands for this topic? Okay, Chris, why don't we go to the next one? Okay, the next one is the uh, um, size of a solar array. So um, Palmer limits the size of an array to, this is the, the power that can be produced by an array. They limit the size to um, five megawatts. And I wanted to point out that the array proposed for Shootsbury Road was more than twice as much as that. Um, it was 11 megawatts. Um, and at the same time, the array proposed for Hickory Ridge that the town is developing would be more than five megawatts. It's 5.24 megawatts. So 
would Amherst want to limit the amount of power that can be generated by an array in Amherst? And mm, I had trouble with this one. Um, I just didn't understand why the town would want to limit the amount of power that could be generated. In other words, I can understand why you would want to limit the size of the array itself. But, you know, as Andrew has brought up in the past, the technology here is always changing. So, you know, it could be that in a short amount of time, a smaller array could produce more energy. So what would be the point of limiting the amount of energy that could be produced by an array? So that, that is the topic here. Okay, thank you. Andrew? I just wanna say my last comment, I thought we were talking about six. So when I said that we're talking about capping, this is the question I was looking at. So if anyone noticed that, uh -huh. that's why I said, I, I agree with Chris. I mean, this seems antithetical to, to what we're trying to do. Right, it's like to maximize efficiency, and if the technology can do that, then fantastic. We should keep pushing it as far as we can. Okay. Uh, Tom changes his mind. Uh, Johanna. Yeah, I agree that we want to get as much energy from clean energy as we can. And then my one thought is the only rationale that I can think of is if there are some kind of grid interconnection reasons why you can only put a certain amount of load onto the grid at a particular geographic location, but it seems like that would happen elsewhere. So I, I would yeah. not, I would recommend we don't pursue this. So we could leave that up to the electric, you know, utility to decide whether they can accept however much power is being generated. All right, no other comments on this one? Um, okay, so the next one is setbacks. So um, I noticed that Schutzberry and Palm, uh, not Palmer, Pelham had pretty big setbacks, but um, Palmer, which is the bylaw that we're focusing on, has a front setback of 250 feet and side and rear setbacks of 100 feet. And I personally thought this seemed excessive. Um, Amherst currently relies on the setbacks that we have for structures for solar arrays. So for instance, the solar array on Bay Road that is owned by Hampshire College, you know, lives within the requirement of, I think it's 25 foot setback. Um, so is there any reason why, well, I can see that Amherst may want to require more than, um, the 25 foot setback or whatever is in the dimensional requirements of table three in our section six, there may be a reason to go more than 25 feet or 15 feet or whatever the setback is there, but would we ever want to go to the extent that Palmer is, um, and set setbacks of uh, hundreds of feet. Does that appeal to people? Is that something that uh, people think would be a good idea in Amherst? Anybody want to give their two cents on that? Janet. So this is, when we got to these kind of things, um, including just the size of the array, is I felt like we needed some site visits, like to go look, you know, um, at some, you know, like just to see different arrays that have different limits and, um, you know, a fair amount are probably within a short drive of here, but I just thought, you know, the Hampshire College one, it's right there, you know, and even if they're trying to put a vegetative buffer, it's, it's, it's not buffering. And um, it's also, you know, like it's part of a scenic view shed from, you know, a state park. And so I'm not anti, Hampshire Color Solar, but it that is a different look and feel than 100 feet or 50 feet or 250 feet. And so um, I would assume the parcel has to be pretty big to have a 200, 250 foot setback. But I wonder again, like, are they trying to preserve their views, uh, you know, to make their town look more attractive? Um, you know, that kind of thing. I did, I just thought it'd be good to have some site visits to look at stuff. I know Athol was very concerned about scenic views. And that was part of them trying to attract tourism and, you know, keep their New England look and, you know, that kind of thing. And so I just thought it was like, let's go look at that. Or some of us can maybe, as we drive around, look at that and try to figure out the, the distances. I mean, 250 sounds really big, but, you know, 
the difference between 100 or 50, you know, or 25 or 150. And it might be just very site specific too. Like, you know, we have scenic roads in Amherst and if they're all filled with solar arrays, whatever that benefit is in terms of the beauty of Amherst could be lost or it might be harder to screen if it's too close to the road. All right, thanks, Janet. You're reminding me that I remember the Hadley bylaw uh, had a fairly small typical setback, but they made an exception for that on Route 47, which was their, their scenic roadway through town mm -hmm. and uh, increased it there. So maybe we want to think about that kind of approach where you know we, we are, are pretty uh, uh, liberal in, in allowing a pretty small setback except where we have particularly scenic, you know, roadway. Johanna. I like that idea of exploring that. And then I also feel like scale matters here. So if you have a one acre array, a small setback, a smaller setback feels potentially prudent. Whereas if you have, you know, I don't know, a 20 acre array or a 40 acre array, I could imagine wanting to recess that more from adjacent properties. So I'd be curious whether other towns or whether there are models for like a scaled approach to the setback, depending on the size of the solar development. That's interesting. Okay. Tom. Um, I, I guess um, one of the questions I have, and this might relate to the vegetated buffer also, is that we're making a value judgment that most people believe solar arrays are ugly um, and that we want to hide them. And I don't necessarily know if that's the case for everybody. And it doesn't apply to ugly buildings. So I could put a giant, ugly metal warehouse building on my farmland 20 feet from the 25 feet from the road and people in that scenic view shed will have to look at that ugly thing and we're not saying that that's wrong so i guess this is an aesthetic value judgment and some people think it's beautiful that we're harnessing the sun to create energy i'm, I'm not i'm not playing one side or the other but we don't hide a lot of other things that we deem ugly or some of us might deem ugly, um, <laughs> just because other people think it's ugly. So um, I, I think we want to be cautious with this. And I do agree with Johanna that um, different scales might require different setbacks. Um, um, so I think that that seems like an appropriate thing to pursue, seeing if anyone else had done that. Yeah, I think at the last meeting, Chris, uh, you had mentioned that Hampshire College was really proud of its solar array. Mm -hmm. and wanted it to be visible and part of their image as a progressive institution that's using a lot of so, uh, sustainable energy. So maybe that's part of Amherst's self-image uh, or could be. Johanna, your hand's still up. Uh, I'm gonna take it down. Um, I guess just Chris, I'm, I tend to be on the small setback kind of end of the spectrum in my reaction to this kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I think uh, even though Western Massachusetts land is not as expensive as in Eastern Massachusetts, um, we are defining the economic parameters for the generation of electricity. And uh, I, I hope we can try to make it as affordable for everyone as we can. And I guess that reminds me of one other thing is that I'm not an expert on utility law, but there seems, my impression is that utilities have fairly wide latitude to do what they need to do to provide the utility service to the Commonwealth. And so the legislature at some point went out of its way to kind of clear the obstacles that local towns might, might make 
for transmission lines or pipelines or those kinds of things. And you know, I, I wonder whether the current uh, law that, that's been discussed with you know not allowing unreasonable restrictions is in that in that vein. And um, you know, if push comes to shove, people want electricity. Um, they don't want to have brownouts or or have long blackouts. So why don't we go to the next one? Okay, so um, Palmer has a requirement for a hundred foot vegetated buffer around each solar array installation. Um, so I had a few thoughts about this. Um, sometimes you can actually get a pretty good dense screen by planting um, lower story and upper story plants. And you may not need to have 100 feet of um, buffer. So I'd be interested in hearing people's thoughts about this and whether they think that um, you know, an extended vegetated buffer around a solar array is necessary or um, you know, potentially less than that. So what are people's thoughts? Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, I think it depends on the purpose, what it's for. If the idea is that it's it's there for a visual boundary, then um, I think you make a good point. If it's there for like wildlife benefit, then then it, it may need to be larger. Um, so that that was as I looked at these two, I was thinking, you know, fencing is it's it's privacy and it's security. Vegetated buffer could be, you know, privacy, but it also could be for wildlife benefit. Um, so I, I don't know how to answer answer this at this point, or what kind of guidance to, to share. But mm -hmm. leave it at that. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Tom. I'll just chime in and say, I'd love to put a vegetated buffer around some of my neighbor's houses too, because I don't like them, but I don't know if we need to hide all of these. Um, so I, I, I like, um, as Andrew said, that I think it's okay to start thinking about how um, it affects our landscape and our ecologies and um, uh, wildlife. Um, I, I don't necessarily think we need to to hide these things with a hundred foot road buffer. Um, so uh, smaller is better for me if we require it at all. Um, planting might be enough as opposed to um, hiding. Um, but anyway, my thoughts. Thanks, Tom. Janet. I think that um, most people find solar arrays but unattractive. And if, if you knew it was coming into your neighborhood but you would never see it, you'd feel so much better about it. And so I would, and I'm also just, I would think a good thick vegetative buffer, oak trees, you know, evergreens, plants, you know, it will sequester carbon. It will be habitat for squirrels and birds. And, you know, I think it'd be great to have a thick screen. I don't think you need a hundred feet, but if you really couldn't even see them in your neighborhood or they don't, you know, you're driving down the street looking at the Pelham Hills and you don't see it, that's fantastic. So I, I do, I do think, you know, I, in Hadley, I know they have those those sad plantings around the um, the solar arrays and half them have died. And I thought, you know, what if that was thicker and better and it would be more useful for animals and be more cleaner air and things like that. And everybody would feel better about it. So I don't know as that as a negative. I also know that if you just let everything go in Amherst with these great soils, things go wild. So I don't think it has to be a super formal planting, but I think it'd be great to screen that. And people knew that it would be screened. They'd probably be more supportive of having it closer to their houses or whatever, so. Okay, thanks, Janet. Maria. Hey, Doug. Um, so I'm glad we're having this conversation because uh, we have different viewpoints. And I actually find solar rays rolling across hills gorgeous. I just drove back into Logan Airport and there's all these fields along my, the turnpike and I love seeing them. I, it, it, I, I really like seeing the sort of rolling sort of wave of the blue and um, seeing it all on people's houses. I've seen driving up to Burlington, they have these arrays that are on poles on farms and I love it. It's like a new or new world or, or the way we need to think about energy, the way we're going to harness uh, this free resource that's bombarding our planet's surface every day that we're not, you know, taking better advantage of. Um, 
as far as the buffer versus fence, um, you know, I talked to my husband about, because he's a ecologist, environmental, uh, something like that, biologist, something. But anyways, the idea that, I, uh, was it Doug that had about, you know, putting the huge arrays along those big um, swaths of um, electric um, easements. <clears throat> I said, what do you think about that? And he said, actually, you know, uh, those are places where animals cut through a lot. And if we were to suddenly, you know, fence this, uh, sort of corridor, a lot of animals won't be able to get through. The small ones could get under, but, you know, like deer, spare, whatever, larger animals wouldn't be able to traverse that. And so the buffer idea, um, not necessarily the 100 foot buffer, but the idea of vegetation instead of fences might be an interesting one. Um, I don't know which is more expensive, but it's interesting in that uh, it would um, maybe, I forget, is the fencing to keep people out or yeah, I, I think the fencing, it's not either or. I think the fencing is needed for public safety to keep you oh, from electrocuting okay. yourself. Oh, well then, well, forget it. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely need the fences. But as far <laughs> as the buffer, uh, I I don't mind seeing them. And so, you know, those are just varying viewpoints. Um, some people hate them and some people love them. And so to, to say one way or the other, um, that's hard because it's a, a subjective thing. Um, but if there's a rational public safety issue, then yeah, I would say let's put that in. But um, to assume everyone hates them, I think is probably not the way to go. All right, Maria, uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Janet, but when you said it, I was thinking that there are definitely people who think that they're beautiful, but people who seem to be pushing against it are pushing against it because of how it looks maybe right and so if if putting a vegetation putting some type of screen up there would make it more compelling for people who would otherwise be against it then then i think that would be a good thing all right a little more diplomatic all right so i noticed it's about 8 15 and we haven't, it's, so we, we're around the time we usually take a break. Um, Chris, I don't remember how many of these items there are and whether um, we have, a, you know, we don't have a really heavy schedule tonight, but we do have some other, uh, you know, we were gonna talk about some other things. Sh should we just take a five minute break now? Yes, any, that, that sounds good, yep. Any, anyone object? So, okay. All right, so it's by my clock, it's 8.17, and we'll come back at 8.22. Thanks a lot.
All right, the time is 8.22, so I invite everyone back. Okay, I see Maria, I see Tom, I see Chris. We're still missing, oh, there's Janet. There's Johanna, there's Pam. So if we can get Andrew, we'll be back at full strength. <clears throat> I suspect Andrew is warming up inside his heated part of the house. <laughs> All right, Pam. Uh, you are muted if you wanted to say something to me. Hello, Mr. Marshall. Hello, Pam. <laughs> Why don't you bring that, that list back up and we'll see if we can finish those items off. And um, maybe that would be a good time to take some public comment. So um, I can just say we can uh, you sort of skim through the rest of these things, but I think there are things that we need to contend with as we're writing our solar bylaw. So um, one of them is fencing and um, Palmer limits the fencing to six feet high. I seem to remember when we've been reviewing solar um, installations in Amherst that the solar developers really wanna have a fence that's seven feet high. And so the one at Hampshire College is seven feet high. And if you want to drive by there and see what that looks like, um, go ahead. They actually needed a special, well, no, they needed to put it seven feet from the property line in order to have a fence that was seven feet high. So that's that. I don't know if we need to talk about that. Do you want me to just run through the rest of these quickly, Doug? Sure. All right. So then um, open space requirement. Palmer requires an area of open space that's equal to the area of the array. So in other words, if you have a one acre array, you need to have an area of one acre that's open space on the same property that's um, available. So that's something that Amherst needs to consider. Does it wanna have such a requirement? Um, glare is an issue. Um, and you know some of these uh, arrays are moving uh, around. And so I think it would maybe harder to control glare on the ones that move around. But in any event, that's also something that we should consider. There's a homeowner on Montague Road who has um, brought this to our attention that um, the, the solar array that lies between Sunderland Road and Montague does cause glare to come into her house. Um, particularly in the winter when the trees don't have any leaves on them. So we need to think about that and determine if we want to, you know, regulate that in any way. And I understand there may be things that 
can be done to the panels themselves that will minimize glare, but it's an issue. Um, another issue is uh, slopes, and um, Palmer limits solar rays to land with slopes that are less than 15%. So is this something that Amherst wants to do? I think one reason for limiting um, the, uh, the slope is that um, there may be more of a chance of erosion if, if you put these things on um, steeper slopes, particularly you know, when you're going in and actually building it. I think once the things are there, and in place and there's vegetation growing around them, you know, there's not as much of a problem with erosion, but there will still be, you know, water falling on the array and then the water, you know, runs off the array quickly and lands on the ground. So there may be reasons to have a limitation on the slope. Um, the other thing that Palmer does with regard to forest sequestration and habitat areas that they um, ask or require developers to preserve an area that's one and a half times the size of the solar array, in addition to the open space that's required. Um, so again, does Amherst want to have this type of requirement? Um, screening is required in Palmer, but it's they say you know where possible. So I'm not exactly sure what that means, um, especially since they have a hundred foot vegetative buffer. Um, Impervious containment for hazardous materials. This seems like a really good idea, especially if you have, you know, battery storage as part of the array and there's a concern about leakage of some kind of hazardous materials. So we'll have to look into that. That needs to be investigated. I don't really understand that um, very well. <clears throat> and the last one here is noise limitations. And Palmer has um, refers to a state law that limits the amount of noise that can come out of certain activities, but it doesn't give a specific you know, noise level. Not like Amherst has a specific noise level for on-site entertainment. Um, which is, you know, 70 decibels or something like that at the property line. Um, anyway, we need to think about noise. I understand from someone who works in our office that, uh, who lives in Conway, that there's been a problem in Conway with noise emanating from a solar array. And whether the solar array isn't properly installed or what the problem is up there, I don't really understand. But this topic needs to be investigated and we need to think about you know, whether we want to put uh, some sort of limitations on noise emanating from these facilities. So, so that's all, um, but I certainly feel like I've uh, learned a lot from, um, you know, reading Palmer's bylaw and also from listening to you tonight. And I'm uh, glad that we've had this conversation. It's really informative. All right. Um, does, it, does anybody have a comment they want to make about any any, any of those last uh, five or six uh, topics? Janet. I have a, I have a comment. I, um, I don't know, the forest sequestration and habitat area and um, mitigation. And I, you know, we were at the last presentation, they were talking about, you know, setting aside, you know, four acres to mitigate the loss of one acre. And like, I never understand that. It's like saying like, I robbed your house and as mitigation, I won't rob the next four houses next to me. Like, you know, I, I don't understand like if you are, you know, cutting down an acre of forest, removing all the soils and, you know, all the, you know, all the roots and you're worried about the loss of the carbon being sequestered, how not cutting the next four acres next to it actually mitigates that damage. And so I wondered if if people are looking at offsets. So you know I you know like off you know when you fly an airplane, you know you're burning using all this carbon dioxide. You can buy offsets like someone else replanting, you know, an organization that replants trees or something like that. So I just wondered if we could look at the issue of offsets, at, you know, instead of mitigation because I just or mitigation through offsets, but something that very concretely, if you're removing, you know, trees or something beneficial. You know, how do you repair that or offset the damage that you've done there? Um, and so that was one issue I was interested in looking at. Thank you, Janet. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, my question is real quick. Um, we're, when I'd done a little bit of uh, research, I pulled up the model zoning for the regulations of solar energy systems from the, the Commonwealth. 
um, which has a lot of the language around, um, like some suggested language around how these bylaws can be set up. Has, do you know if that is the framework that um, these other communities have used or that we would be using or? Is this, is this the one from DOER? Uh, Matt, let's see. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, I, I, I looked at that one and it, it didn't look to me like that was the basis for any of the actual bylaws in some of the surrounding neighborhoods. It, it looked frankly to me like maybe one of the neighborhood, one of the towns originated it. And since Michael Di Chiara had called in and acted like he had, had kind of drafted the one in Shutesbury, that maybe that was the first one, and then Pelham adopted it, and Belchertown used it, and ver and you know edited it, and so, but but none of them seemed very close to the DOER one. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know any of the background. It's just I, when I saw it, I was I was maybe I guess surprised because originating from the Commonwealth and having, you know, addressing some of the same things we're talking about right now. Okay, Chris. So yeah, we're going to look at the um, DOER model bylaw. We're also going to look at Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's guidelines for um, establishing a bylaw. And I have recently been reading the um, Cape Cod, um, what do they call it? Cape Cod Commission's bylaw, which I think is really good. And so I'll send that to you all. But we're going to be, you know, kind of like putting the best of the things that we can find together to try to make a really good bylaw for Amherst. And um, I don't know if there's one particular one that we're going to, you know, pick that one and go with it. So okay. that's all I have to say. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Janet. Um, Chris, could we add Athol's to that list? Because I thought that was a pretty um, good one. And um, sort of creative in terms of how it was addressing problems that the community cared about. So I thought they had good language. This was this was the study that they Yeah. And then I it's hard I think we could I think I think I ran across a separate version of it that wasn't embedded in like a two million page report. But um I thought that had good language too. Uh -huh. All right. Johanna. Thanks. Um I have a question about the slopes and a question about the forest sequestration one. So the slopes, um, I'm just, I'm like mentally mapping Amherst in my head and trying to figure out where are the parts in town that have slopes greater than 15 degrees. I imagine towards the Pelham Hills, there's something like that. But I, again, I'd just be curious how much potential land are we taking off the table? with that restriction. Um, and then the second question, the forest sequestration and habitat area, are they in Palmer, do they only require developers to put into conservation additional land if they cut down forests for solar? Or is this just standard? Like if you put in solar, then you also have to set aside an area, you know, one and a half times that big in conservation? And does it have to be in the same parcel or could you, yeah, could you like buy land in Alaska? Um, so I don't, I guess I have, I have questions about that. And then my guess is I would not support that type of requirement for solar developments in Amherst, but I feel like I'd need more information to know. All right, Johanna. Uh, Chris, uh, I guess my comments on these, first of all, on the fencing, I noticed that one, at least one of the bylaws not only had a, had a height uh, at the top, but it had a minimal amount of clearance that was open at the bottom to allow small animals to pass without restriction. And I thought that was a good idea. Um, on the open space and forest sequestration, um, I, I feel like I'd be very reluctant to support those, 
partly because the town has so much conservation land. Um, and if we were in a town that had very little conservation land, maybe I would be more open to that. But since we, you know, something like a third of our town land is already conservation land, um, I, I, I question the need to be setting aside more uh, kind of by, by fiat. Uh, you know, if, if there's people that want to buy more land in town and set it aside, then that's a different conversation. Um, glare, I, you know, I agree that's something we need to be sensitive to. Um, and, um, you know, whether it's, but I think we'd want to study it on a case by case basis, maybe simply say that, you know, the developer needs to take into account uh, the impacts of glare on adjacent occupied structures and, uh, you know, mitigate, mitigate any, any negative impacts. And then we talk about it on a project by project basis. Um, that's, I guess that's all I'll say on these. All right, I don't see any other hands. Why don't we uh, do some public comment? Um, and so I see uh, 15 public attendees at this time. Thank you all for hanging in with us on this conversation. Uh, I know there's been a little bit of attrition as we've gone through the evening. Um, yeah, let's start with three minutes and please do everything you can to not exceed that amount. So at the moment, the, the only hand is Dorothy Pams. Uh, Dorothy, could you give us your give us your address? We all probably know your name. Okay, uh, 229 Amity Street, Amherst. Um, two comments. We're lucky we're talking solar and not wind power. Before we lived here, we lived in Norfolk for seven years, the highest occupied settled place in Connecticut, and it has wind. It has some fabulous wind power, but they're causing problems for people around them in terms of noise and rear whoop whoop things. So there are a lot of problems. Solar is kind of quiet in comparison, but I do want to comment on what is beautiful. Um, you know, there are several different ways. You may love something for one reason, but aesthetics, there are some agreed upon codes. I was born in Long Beach, California. My dad worked for Shell Oil. And he thought that the derricks in the water off the, on the coast were beautiful. And people who live in um, the place where oil was struck on the land, they think they're beautiful. So I'm glad some people think solar arrays are beautiful for the same reason my dad loved those oil derricks. But that's not what people are talking about, okay? So um, I think it's been really interesting, a wonderful list of questions. And um, you know, I don't know the answers to most of them. Um, I do think that somewhere, I don't know if there were any questions about efficiency in terms of do some sizes uh, or arrays uh, increase the power production or is solar kind of equal no matter what the size is that you can do it. Um, so I think you know some of, some of those questions might be looked at and, and to gotten some answers, but I think you have a, a great start on what you've been starting talking about tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, do we have any other members of the public that would like to make a comment this evening? Okay. Um, so the time is 8.41. Um, Chris, I, uh, do you think we've had a sufficient discussion for your purposes tonight? Yes, thank you very much. This was really helpful and interesting. Yep. Great. Um, and we did not go through uh, the conditions that the ZBA has imposed at, uh, I think it was Hickory Ridge that you had included in our packet. Mm -hmm. And you included a little site plan of that, of that uh, installation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I guess, Maybe at a later date we can come back and talk, talk, look at one of those, and and just see kind of what the parts are that need to happen. Um, 
you know, in terms of vehicular access and, and, and you know, you can confirm my understanding that the fence is required for public safety. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, you know, and if there's any knowledge about a battery and, you know, is that supposed to be close to the road and the vehicle, you know, needs to drive up to it or I also have heard uh, you might talk to uh, someone at the fire department about the batteries uh, because I've heard it was an anecdotal second or third hand thing about some sort of requirement that Hadley was imposing on batteries that sounded kind of nonsensical to me like they thought they might go up and you know fight a fire at a battery with water and you know, that's electrical and you, you probably aren't going to do that. So I, I'm probably wrong about what I heard. So I'm not trying to offend anybody in Hadley, but um, that's, that's, that's something we should look into. All right, so um, Janet. Um, on the issue of batteries, I think that, um, I think it's a question for the fire department. Um, battery fires really, really burn and they're really hard to put out. And so um, that would be an issue. Can the fire department handle that? You know, like, you know, put it, put out, you know, the actual fire with water or chemicals and then trying to contain the, the chemicals used and not having it spread all over the place. It might, if it's a large battery, it might be too much for them to handle. Yeah, it may be that we, we want it just in an in, enclosure in that allows it to burn and nothing gets out. You know, yeah, and you don't have to do that. Because so you don't that's... really, you can't really fight it because you really can't put it out. But we don't want the chemicals to be, dis, you know, diffused. Um, Nathan, Nathan uh, Nathaniel, I'm seeing your hand. You haven't. Sure. Uh, can Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. I don't know if my video is working. I was on my phone earlier. The um, yeah, I think the battery storage is interesting. I've heard at Hickory Ridge that the utility companies and fire like it to be visible from the road so that they can do drive-by inspections and that they have to be easily accessed, whether that means, um, you know, close to the road or, um, you know, outside the fence enclosure and then right off the access road. So I, I do think it's something to consider if there's larger um, or, you know, arrays that are in forested areas or set back from the road, what does that mean for, you know, utility connects and batteries? Um, but, you know, that's what I've been told at Hickory Ridge that the location was really for uh, visibility from the road and access, easy access along the, you know, in the site. Okay. Chris, you have your hand up. Uh, do you want to say something? Yeah, um, I heard from someone, I can't remember who it was, that um, battery storage is going to be required as part of solar arrays going forward. So that's definitely something that we need to consider. And um, I think that we're going to be seeing more of that. So, you know, whatever um, limitations or protection or whatever is involved with batteries, we need to think about that. Yeah, as I understand it, it's an, it's a, a, a a tool to even out the uh, power that's going into the grid um, so that, you know, if we suddenly, if the clouds break, we don't just suddenly get all the electricity streaming into the grid, we can put some of it into the battery and even out the peaks. Okay, um, so let's conclude, consider this the end of the solar bylaw discussion for this evening. Uh, the time is 8.46. Um, Chris, shall we turn to the other zoning priorities conversation? Yes, that would be a great idea. And right. I, um, I can start to go through that with you. Yeah, um, we, had, we had two sheets. One was the one that I had put together of last year's stuff. Mm -hmm. And then yours with the, uh, with the, the department's suggested priorities. We're, Do you want to go through that chart, that colorful chart that you put together and talk about the um, things that we haven't done? Or do you want to talk about the things on the planning department's priority list? Which one? I think we should start with the chart of last year's priorities. So uh, okay. can Cam, can you put that, that on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, 
almost there. I think. Yep. Not this one. Yep. This is it. This is it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. So, so, so do ahead. you want me to launch into this? Yeah, you should. You should do it. The content is yours. I only put the, you know, put the colors on it. Yep. So um, just to say that um, obviously the town council has a little different makeup this year than it had last year. So the things that were um, priorities to town council last year may or may not be priorities for them this year or for the next two years. Um, but in any event, um, there were certain things that were town council priorities that we did manage to um, have adopted. And one of them was um, revising this supplemental dwelling unit bylaw. Um, we drafted a new accessory dwelling unit bylaw and the planning board did recommend that and it was adopted by town council. Um, town council also had um, an apartments, one of, one of their priorities was to look at the apartments bylaw and try to make it easier to build apartments um, in other locations. So the, um, we did draft a new bylaw that allowed apartments to be built or approved by site plan review in the RVC zoning district. Um, but at the same time, we made it more difficult to build apartments in the BG by making it a special permit. And that was recommended by the planning board and adopted by town council. Um, town council had another priority of um, the temporary zoning bylaw to help people cope with, to help businesses cope with um, the COVID crisis. And um, Rob Mora drafted the bylaw. Um, it was recommended by the planning board, actually two versions of it. And the last version was in December that was recommended by the planning board and it was adopted by town council. So this um, temporary zoning will carry through December of 2022. So we're very happy about that. Um, another town council priority was um, rezoning the parcel 14A-33, which is the parcel behind CBS to allow, um, they originally wanted, the, the sponsors originally wanted that to become a BG zoning district, but um, the planning department worked with Rob Mora and <clears throat> developed a bylaw that created a parking facility district, an overlay district. And um, the planning board recommended that and that was adopted by town council. And then the last one here that was a uh, town council priority that was um, adopted was a change in the parking regulations for residential uses. So we drafted a bylaw, it was recommended by the pl planning board and it was adopted by town council. So those were um, five very, I consider them good successes of town council priorities that were adopted. Um, planning department also had a couple of priorities that were adopted and one of them was to um, revise the mixed use buildings definitions and standards bylaw and um, so we did that it was mostly uh, the definitions that were um, revised although I think we had a, a few standards in there too and that was recommended by the planning board and adopted by town council and um, we also had a a very good experience with the inclusionary zoning bylaw where we drafted the bylaw, we uh, planning board recommended it and it was adopted and um, it does um, promise to produce new units, which we are, you know, becoming more and more aware of as, as people propose new projects. So that's, that's a great thing. Um, so going back to things that we didn't um, make much progress on, um, adding footnote B to the BL zoning district, that was an attempt to um, loosen up zoning in the BL district, particularly around the downtown. And those are areas north of Triangle Street and west of the downtown um, in the vicinity of Halleck Street and um, what's the other one, North Prospect Street. Anyway, um, so allowing more residential use and Rob Mora and Nate Malloy came up with a, an overlay district for that area. And we did discuss drafts of it with the planning board. 
Um, and the planning board never really, um, well, that it didn't really go through the process. So we kind of got, um, I don't know if you want to say distracted, but we got taken up with other things. And so that's something that we could go back to if people were interested in that. Um, town council also um, had demolition delay uh, bylaw revisions as one of its priorities. And we did draft a new bylaw and we presented it to the planning board in, um, in June of last year. And then again in February of this year, um, we actually had a very good conversation with the planning board on February 2nd and, and Janet McGowan came up with um, several concerns and, and questions. And recently Ben Breger and I had a great meeting with Janet and discussed a lot of her uh, comments and concerns. And we think we have um, something that, you know, most people will um, be supportive of. And so we're hoping to bring that um, back to the planning board soon. Um, I think it might have gone to the historical commission tonight. I'm not sure, but anyway, it will have to go back to the historical commission to get their blessing because they're the ones who are really bringing it forward. But um, we think that the, that the changes that were um, made are going to make it easier for this thing to be adopted. And it would be going from the zoning bylaw into the general bylaw. So Janet may have some comments that she wants to make about that um, when I'm finished here. Um, <clears throat> so another town council priority was removing footnote M. And I'm sure you will all remember all the research and presentations and discussions we had about that. Um, the planning board um, never really that, that never really got off the ground, so to speak. I think there are aspects of that that we might wanna bring back, but um, probably not the full removal of footnote M for the whole RG district. It may make sense to remove footnote M for certain parcels around the outside of the RG, but we have to go back and look at that. But we did put a lot of wor work into that. And it's, um, you know, it's an idea that's still, there, but we, we never really uh, saw it through. Um, revising the apartments definition was also a town council priority. And that was, um, that was to remove the cap on the number of units in an apartment building. And um, again, that was something that we drafted and we discussed it with the planning board and um, that never really uh, got off the ground either. So we're gonna probably go back and look at that. Um, <clears throat> town Council had another priority, which was setting up design guidelines or design standards or looking at form based code and Town Council approved funding of $100,000. Uh, the department uh, planning department is developing an RFP to hire a consultant to help us out with that and we're hoping to hire a consultant later this spring um, and get going on that project. So we're really excited about that. Nate has put together a good RFP that we'll be bringing to you at some point once it's, um, once it's gotten uh, you know, really, really gelled. Um, so what else do we wanna talk about here? Uh, let's see. In orange, we have the temporary moratorium on solar installations that um, was presented to the planning board. The planning board recommended against it. Um, CRC recommended for it, but it seems that some CRC members are having second thoughts about that. So in any event, it's going back to town council on um, the 28th of February, and we'll see what happens with that. Um, town council had a priority of adding footnote A, which is allowing um, some things to be modified with a special permit, um, and that would relate to uh, maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage. This is something that, um, you know, I think there was one particular council member who's not a council member anymore who was very interested in this. So we'll see where that goes. I don't know how wedded the town council is to that particular item anymore. Um, working with town council on different housing types, that is still front and center for us. Um, and that relates to uh, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, converted dwellings, et cetera. It's an effort to allow more housing to be built 
perhaps not at the grand scale of apartment buildings and mixed use buildings, but on a smaller scale, but um, that could allow some infill to happen. So we're very interested in work in continue to, continuing to work on that. Um, dimensional regulations in RG and RVC. Um, again, there may not be that much interest in that anymore on the part of town council, but we haven't heard from them on that item. It's not something that we uh, in the planning department are have as one of our high priorities. Um, duplexes and triplexes, I already talked about that. And then that relates to the different housing types. So yes, we're very interested in doing that. Uh, frontage regulations for residential districts, again, that probably really relates to the RG district. And, um, you know, we're not, we're, that's not on our list of priorities, but we'll have to hear from town council about what their priorities are. Um, looking at uses in the village centers, I think that's a really good one. That was something that Dorothy Pam brought up a long time ago. And um, if we're putting more um, residential units in village centers, then we need to think about, you know, allowing uses that are appropriate for people who are living there. And um, so, we'll, you know, that's probably something that we'll want to look at. Uh, transportation issues, I never really understood exactly what town council wanted us to do with that. So that's a topic for discussion, for future discussion, but it's not on the planning department's list of priorities. Um, recodification of the zoning bylaw. Um, we made a pretty good attempt at recodification, um, I guess it was maybe two years ago, and Ben Brager came up with a, a format that seemed to work really well, but we got so involved in other um, zoning amendments that we haven't really pursued that, and so that may be something that you'll be seeing in the, in the future. And then this last thing, the planning department um, had a priority of working on the flood maps and text. Um, that was, that is certainly a priority for us. In fact, it's become more of a priority now because <clears throat> we managed to get through our third appeal process in December without having any appeals. So we're moving into um, the time when we'll be hearing from um, FEMA. They'll be sending us a letter. It's called a letter of final determination. And it means that they're satisfied with the maps, the flood maps, and that we need to move forward with um, developing a zoning bylaw to accompany the flood maps and to get the flood maps, the zoning bylaw and the flood, Im flood insurance study adopted by town council in the next six to nine months. And Nate is working on um, the text of the zoning bylaw to accompany the flood maps. So I think that's, uh, that gives you an idea of where we are with last year's priorities. Thanks, Chris. Um, so does anybody want to, you know, say, I mean, maybe we should go on to the second slide, which was where the which was the uh, planning department priority list, at least as you guys have drafted it. So Chris, okay. do you want, I mean, you've talked sure. about uh, most of yeah. the, but do you want to just explain yeah, how this came up and, and who's seen it and whether it has endorsement at this point? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the town manager has seen it. Dave Zomek has seen it. Um, CRC either has seen it or is going to see it on the 24th, um, CRC being the Community Resources Committee. Um, some of these things we absolutely, we know we absolutely need to get done. Um, and obviously flood mapping is one of them. We have a limited amount of time now that we've gotten through this last appeal period. Now we have a limited amount of time in which to get all of this um, adopted. So we're going full bore on that. Um, in fact, we're having a presentation before the town council to um, remind all the previous town council members and also uh, familiarize new town council members with this whole project. We're giving them a presentation on the 28th. It won't be a very in-depth presentation, but it'll just be to introduce the topic and to tell them we'll come back in 
a month or two with more information. So that's, I'd say, our primary priority. Um, then, of course, we have the solar bylaw and uh, solar study assessment. Um, and that was brought to us by um, two town council members and um, really the moratorium was brought to us by the town council members. So we knew that we had to work on the solar bylaw as a result of, you know, people being very concerned about um, solar uh, installations that were being proposed. So we know we have to work on that. Um, design standards is something that we've talked about for years. And I think, you know, there are several town council members who are, if not all of them, uh, really interested in this, setting up design standards for buildings as well as um, streetscape in the downtown area. And um, so we're, you know, working hard on hiring a consultant to help us with that. Um, number four is uh, Article 14. And um, Rob Mora, building commissioner, is very interested in allowing some of the uses that were um, for which permitting was loosened up a bit uh, during the COVID period, um, allowing some of those uses to um, not have to go through special permit. Uh, process with the Zoning Board of Appeals to, um, to be allowed to happen. For instance, class one and class two restaurants. Um, you know, he's been able to approve several of them under Article 14, but Article 14 is going to be expiring in December of this year. So which of those uses that was allowed by Article 14 can be um, allowed by an administrative approval by the building commissioner if there are appropriate criteria and conditions set for these things to be allowed. And then temporary uses is um, a category that we've been aware of for a long time, but we haven't been able to uh, really deal with it. And it's, you know, if if someone wants to do something um, for one day or a weekend or a week or whatever, um, and it could be something like, you know, Bank of America wants to use the parking lot behind their building for some sort of festival, you know, a, a, a dance festival or an art festival or whatever. They really can't do that now because there's no mechanism in the bylaw to allow them to do that. If someone wants to use a farm out on Southeast Street and have a, a wedding, set up a tent, have music, have people come, and then, uh, you know, may have a caterer or something like that. And that could be um, a type of use that could support uh, the farming enterprise. We can't do that either. So, you know, temporary uses, we'd really like to be able to allow them, but there's no mechanism to allow us to do that. So that's something that we're interested in working on those first four things. And then, as I mentioned before, the demolition delay bylaw, we think we're um, getting into the home stretch on that. And um, members of town council have shown interest in that. And certainly um, planning department staff and the building commissioner are very interested in getting that through um, town council. The number six here is uh, something that's been so those five things we're working on now and hoping to continue to work on them through the spring. The, the sixth thing is parking. And there are so many aspects to parking that are troublesome to people. Um, the municipal parking district, how does it work? Is it working well? Do we wanna keep it? Do we wanna change it? Um, do we wanna be able to have um, a fee in lieu of providing parking? In other words, is there something about the municipal parking district that we can say, well, you know, maybe developers have to provide half a parking space per dwelling unit, but they don't have enough space on their property to do that. Well, can we charge them a fee in lieu of providing the parking that would feed into a transportation fund that could help us to pay for, um, you know, a, a garage or building a second story on the Bulletwood garage or something like that. So that's what that's about. Um, we also want to do a structural analysis of the Boltwood garage and find out, could it really, in, in fact, uh, take another story? That was something that was planned for when it was developed in the early 2000s, but 
we're not sure now whether it really can um, accommodate another story. And then looking at other locations for uh, parking structures in case we decide we don't want to go with the CVS lot or Boltwood garage or there are other locations. So there are a lot of things here that about parking that we'd like to explore. We're not going to plan on doing that till the fall, unless we're given a directive by the town manager to do that. But um, so this is our plan. Uh, we'd also like to speak with private landowners, um, especially in the downtown about how they manage their parking and whether they'd be willing to partner with the town to explore shared parking. And this was something that was um, mentioned as a recommendation in the parking report from Nelson Nygaard that we got a number of years ago. So those are the planning department's um, phase one priorities. Um, phase two priorities really just means that we'll probably work on them after these first six things. Um, again, number one has to do with different types of housing and how do we uh, get it, how do we make it easier to build these different types of housing? And maybe in A, duplexes converted dwellings and triplexes, maybe some of them have to be owner occupied. We don't really know, we haven't explored it enough, but we, we realize that these are important things to, um, to talk about. And um, I know Maria has brought up the idea of the missing middle. And, you know, so we have single family houses and we have apartment buildings and mixed use buildings, but we don't have these smaller kind of infill types of housing that, that we really need. So that's something that we wanna look at. Um, number two, breweries, wineries, and distillers. I'm not sure how many distillers we have, but um, breweries and wineries is something that um, many, uh, maybe many isn't the right word, several people have come to us and said, can we have a brewery somewhere in Amherst? And you, you can do it in some places like um, down on University Drive where AB, uh, the hangar is, is located. ABC used to have a brewery down there. Um, ABC also had a brewery in um, the building that now is going to house the Drake. Um, but those are, you know, fairly limited locations. Other people have asked us if they could have breweries with beer tastings in outlying areas. And one of the places that has been mentioned is um, an old concrete apple storage building on I don't know if it's Middle Street or Southeast Street in South Amherst, but it's a building that's been vacant for a long time and nobody can figure out a good use for that. So as I said, a number of people have come forward to say, can we have a brewery there? And not, not right now, you can't do that. So we'd like to explore that possibility. And we actually got um, a district local technical assistance grant from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to explore uh, the idea of breweries and wineries in Amherst. And it would be good for um, economic development, potentially good for the tourist industry. So we'd like to be able to explore it. And we know that other cities and towns around here uh, do offer that as a use. Um, student housing district, that's something that um, Rob Mora has been interested in uh, looking into. Um, it was the thing a long time ago, there was a student housing district um, close to the university, um, but a lot of problems occurred as a result of, you know, rowdy behavior in um, fraternities and sororities. And so the town rezoned it to not allow those things to happen. But we're thinking that maybe we could go back to that and explore it in a more um, careful way so that we would have control over behavior. Um, marijuana uses, that's another thing that many or several people have come to us and said, you know, can, can we look at the buffer zones? We have a 300 foot buffer zone around places where children congregate. Can we look at that and see if there's any ability to loosen that up? Because it, uh, right now it means that there aren't very many places in town where you can have um, marijuana uses. Another thing is uh, people want to look at the idea of delivery service. Um, other towns allow delivery service. And so uh, right now there's a delivery service that's based in East Hampton and it wants to be able to deliver to Amherst and it will be able to deliver to Amherst. 
Um, but we currently don't allow a delivery service that's based in Amherst to deliver to Amherst. And so if we did, that would be another economic development and potential uh, source of revenue for the town. And then uh, other people want to explore the idea of on-site consumption. That's something that keeps coming up. We get phone calls frequently about that. So those are, those are things that we'd like to look at. And there's one thing that's not on this list, um, which is the rental bylaw. So we have that rental bylaw that requires um, anybody who's renting a unit to uh, register it with the town. And a number of um, council members have approached the building commissioner about working on the rental bylaw and making it more, um, what should I say, uh, making it more robust, I guess, is the best, best way of saying that. So the building commissioner has been working with this group of council members to um, try to figure out how to make the rental bylaw work better and um, you know, potentially control behavior and you know, potentially control the number of houses that are converted from single family houses to student rentals. Um, so that's something that I'm not working on, but the building commissioner is working on it with a group of, uh, I think there are five to eight council members who are interested in this topic. So that really doesn't have any, I don't think it has zoning implications, but it may. So um, I put it on my list. It's not on the list that's up here on the screen, but it is um, part of my list that I've been talking to the town manager about. So I guess I'll stop talking there and, and uh, listen to you if you have anything to say about any of these things. Yeah, I guess, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, that was pretty in depth and you had a long monologue there. Take a, take a glass of water. Um, I, will. I, I think uh, one, of, one of my hopes for this uh, material was if uh, board members had things that, they, that we worked on last year that they hoped we would come back to, um, you know, this would be a good time to mention that. Uh, we could also put this on the agenda next time and let people think about it a little bit. So I guess I'd, I'd ask the board what kind of, do you, do you wanna do anything with this or should we just move on to whatever the pressing topic of the, of the, of the week is? Maria. Did I hear you say pressing or depressing topic? <laughs> pressing. I hope, okay, well. <laughs> Um, yeah, we worked really hard back when we had the ZSC on a lot of these initiatives for uh, a few people who are no longer with the board. And um, there were some that were really exciting. I felt like we had um, learned a lot from and learned that, oh, our initial trajectory should actually really change. And um, one of the big ones that I think has been going, well, all of them have been going for decades, but the BL district has always been a uh, a conundrum, but I think with the form-based zoning, maybe that might take care of some of that. Um, the housing, of course, is always a really close to my heart, but you know, um, that's sort of an ongoing thing as well, and it's a big thing to take on. Um, I guess my question is for phase one, the the list that Chris um, showed that that's a lot of work, and so I don't know if it's the right time to tackle a lot of the ones that are in the colored chart because phase one is um, stuff they have to do and has the you know definitive deadlines they all say start spring of this year so yeah I don't I, I guess it's sort of you know I, I would lean on the planning department to tell us whether they can take on you know whether it's uh, re uh, configuring the ZSC or if we do that thing again where a lot of people from the planning board were on the ZSC, so I might as well just have these discussions with the planning board. And so if our agendas are kind of light moving forward, it might be nice to take on um, a few of the ones from the colored chart. And honestly, I'm about to step down in June. So I'd rather, you know, the people who are staying on to take the, you know, uh, initiative and pick things that they're really passionate about and take the lead on, you know, diving into those. So that's why I, I'm not going to prioritize. I'm just asking questions like, you know, A, 
does the planning department have time to dive into these other initiatives and, and B, yeah, if the other board members have particular things, maybe it's not tonight, but maybe the next one. Um, any of these priorities in the color chart, whether they need more information or if they're, you know, really interested in diving deep into one or two of those at a time. Cause I think we felt like when we took on too many, it was just too much. So we kind of dove into one, one month and then another, another month. So um but yeah, I, I think it's great for the planning department to do some, I'm oh, sorry, planning board to take on some planning. Um, that's a, especially with the um, really great new members who are, you know, just really diverse and really um, intelligent and thoughtful about so many things. I think we should definitely take advantage of that, um, the members of the, you know, the new planning board and um, dive into some of these priorities. So, um, but I, 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 I'm not going to, choose any particular one because again I I'm leaving in a few months <sighs> so <laughs> but anyways um thank you yeah for putting these lists together and not just dropping it because um there was a lot of work not just from us but from you know decades and decades of uh, previous members who sort of um got us to this point so um so yeah I, I'm not sure I said anything really but <laughs> but that's it all right Maria thank you Chris, your hands up. So I wanted to answer the question of whether the planning department has the um, capability of working on more things. Um, and I think the answer is in the near term, probably not. Um, we have items one through four that are, you know, pretty pressing that, um, but item three, the design standards, that's something that's going to stretch out over I'm guessing 18 months to two years, you know, that's going to be a long term project. And um, so that, you know, we don't feel like we have to finish that any soon. Obviously, we'd like to get something in place um, before there's a lot more development downtown, but um, that's going to be a longer term project. But flood mapping, solar bylaw are certainly short term. Article 14, since it's um, expiring at the end of December, we want to get something in place if if this is something that people want to do. Um, we need to get something in place uh, certainly before the end of the year. And the demo delay bylaw, I think, is, you know, people have been working on it for a long time and want to get that taken care of. Um, so in the near term, I think, you know, until probably sometime in the summer, early fall, we probably don't have enough um, bandwidth to work on new things but you know come fall we, we certainly will and um this parking issue it's something that's been you know bothering us for a long time there's also a council member who's brought this um or will potentially bring this to council a number of these things and she wants um people to start looking at these so we thought we'd you know just put it on our list and say we're going to work on it starting in the fall so that's that's all I have to say. All right, thanks, Chris. Johanna. I mean, ultimately, I think I'm inclined to defer to the planning department staff on what the key priorities are. You all are paying attention to the town council and what's moving there, and you know, yeah, the deadlines for what's expiring. I will. I think it's my understanding that the town council was on a retreat this weekend to discuss what their like shared priorities are likely to be for the coming year. And I don't know if the, but to me, housing feels like an urgent, important issue in our town. And so I'm glad to see it on phase two. Um, and I, there's part of me that like wants to nudge it up into phase one, just because, you know, the longer we, the longer we don't move on it, the greater the problem gets. So, but, you know, again, totally defer to you. And this seems like a really solid list and, you know, we'll stop there. All right, thanks, Johanna. Maria, are you, you have another comment? just a short one then it doesn't sound like we should reconvene the zsc and i yeah i i would love if we had light agendas in the planning board just to bring up a topic of um you know 
housing or BL or apartments. But um, yeah, again, I same with what Johanna is saying. I defer to the planning department to, you know, put the most pressing things in front of us. But um, yeah, that's it. Okay, Janet. I completely agree with what Maria said um, about the timing issues and the amount of work that phase one will take. And um, okay, I think it was like two years ago that the planning board, we thought the priority should be downtown planning, which looks like it's gonna be taken care of partly by the design guidelines and also housing is a really critical issue. And then the, um, the recodification, which looks like it's gonna move ahead at its whatever pace it can. But um, it does, this phase one is a formidable list. And um, when you, Maria was talking about housing, I was like, you had all those great ideas for the missing middle. So maybe we'll pull you back in <laughs> or something to, you know, in terms of the design and the look of buildings. So I think that's really important to people as density increases in neighborhoods. Um, so, I, so I just wanna support Johanna's comment too. I, I just agree with what she said. I, I think this, in terms of the parking, I think that we've had a lot of reports on parking. There's a lot of good ideas. But the parking issues, which aren't all zoning, or really lack a home in terms of like a, a group or a, um, you know, a department taking it on. So I think if it's coming to reside in planning, I think that's great because it's got a lot of different facets. And some of them are, you know, some of them are zoning issues, some of them are, you know, just talking to landowners to share parking, which, which I think isn't a great idea because a lot of those businesses just function in the day. And so there are lots can use at that time. So I think it's exciting that the planning department is sort of staking, you know, taking, hopefully taking that on in a holistic way. Because I think there's a lot of ways to tweak it, but no one's really been in charge of it in terms of solutions and adjustments. All right, thanks, Janet. Uh, Chris, I guess my, my, my uh, probably first priority on phase two would be the housing and and whether you know whether it's whether it's explicitly student housing or whether it's the I would probably put the student housing over the low and medium density housing uh, although that might be part of the solution to the student housing issue um, but I do think we'd be well served to think about where we want to put student housing and where, where we can have more of it so that uh, we take the pressure off single family homes. We have more students living closer to campus so there's less driving and carbon emissions. Um, and maybe so that more students are living in town as opposed to in Hadley. Uh, and we can recover some of their purchasing, uh, you know, whether it's groceries or clothes or whatever. All right, uh, Janet, is that a legacy hand? All right, um, so Chris, I guess that's our conversation about that this evening. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, the time is 9.25 and we're through our uh, item three on our agenda with, with zoning discussions. Um, item four is old business. Chris, do we have any old business? No old business, no. Nope. All right. Uh, any new business? Uh, not no. anticipated, no? no? No new business. All right. Form A, A&R subdivisions? Yes, we have two of those that Pam will um, show you. All right, great. I'll show them, but um, Chris, do you want to talk about them probably? Yes, so um, Pam created this locust map for property on Sand Hill Road. Right. And there are three lots there, the two turquoise lots and the one yellow lot. And the idea is that um, we're going to combine one of the turquoise lots with the yellow lot and slightly change the uh, property line between the two turquoise lots. So Pam can bring that up. Um, here it is, yep. So um, she's got the existing lines um, in green and yeah. um, the one existing line that uh, is to the right in green 
is going to go away mm -hmm. and the two lots, the lot with the house on it and the lot that's vacant are going to be combined. And then um, the property that is farther to the Northwest um, is going to, I think that also has a house on it, but it will um, gain some property that little rectangle that's 25 feet by 100 feet is going to be added to the house to the property um, there that Pam is uh, moving her cursor around. So that's really it. It's really just a question of combining those two lots on the right and adding a little piece to the lot on the left. And if you would um, allow um, Doug Marshall to sign this on behalf of the planning board, that would be lovely. All right, Chris, thank you. Do we have any questions about this, Janet? Do you, I, I think I understand what's happening. Do you know why or what their plans are? We don't. No, they haven't talked to us about that. Nope. Okay. okay, are there any other comments, questions? All right. Um, can I have a motion to allow me to sign this on our behalf? that we agree approval is not required under the subdivision bylaw. Johanna? So moved. All right. Uh, second, Andrew? I'll second. All right. Uh, we'll go through the roll call. If, uh, no more discussion. Any hands for discussion? OK. Uh, Maria? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Tom. Looks, Is Tom there? We, looks like we've lost Tom. Lost Tom. Yeah, okay. Um, Andrew. Aye. Uh, Janet. Aye. And Johanna? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Okay. Want to move on to the next one, Pam? Yep. Sure do. There you go. Okay, this property is at the corner of Stanley Street and Belchertown Road. Um, let's see, how could I describe Stanley Street? Stanley Street is right near where the Amherst Nursery is. Um, so over to the left, you see this uh, grayish parcel. That's where the Amherst Nursery is. So these parcels that are outlined here in yellow and blue, there are um, little old houses on those two lots. And um, a developer wants to purchase the lots and build duplexes on each one. And... Um, there is an example of a duplex across the street, across Stanley Street, which is, a, in my opinion, a pretty decent looking house. So we don't have a picture of it, but I think that's uh, the same owner of the existing duplex wants to um, build duplexes on these two properties. So if Pam would bring up the ANR plan, it'll show how the property line is changing. So you saw how the property line kind of slanted um, which is shown by this dotted line. I don't know if Pam can bring her cursor over there. Yeah, um, we can make it even bigger. Oh yeah, so now you can see the dotted line where the existing um, uh, property line is and they're changing it to um, the solid line um, between the two properties, lot one and lot two. So there, oh, that's a good image. Yeah, yeah. changing it to the red. And so they want to have a duplex on each property and there would be enough room for um, duplexes on each property. Now they haven't been to the historical commission about taking down the existing houses. So that's a, that is a step that they will need to go through. And then they'll also need to get approval um, from the zoning board of appeals to build um, non-owner non occupied duplexes in this location. So there are a number of steps that they'll have to go through to actually do what they're proposing. But for now, they're just proposing to change the property line. So will you authorize Doug Marshall to sign 
this plan on behalf of the planning board. So. All right. Thanks, Chris. Andrew. I'll make a motion to that effect. Okay, thank you. Anybody want a second? All right, Janet, you raised your physical hand. Janet seconds the motion. Okay, um, any more discussion? No? All right, uh, Maria? Sorry, Doug, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Are they proposing to take down the exist all of the existing structures or just some of them? Or is, yeah. Okay, uh, Chris, do you know the answer? I haven't talked to the, um to anyone about what the proposal is, but my understanding is they're going to build duplexes on each of these parcels is that they would be taking down the existing buildings. Um, mm -hmm. But that has not come before the historical commission. They would need to come before the historical commission because both of these houses are over 50 years old. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, uh, Andrew. Yeah, not a question. I was just going to say I heard from Tom. He's having Wi-Fi issues, so he may oh, may there have he is. He's here. All right. Great. Welcome back, Tom. You missed you missed one A in our vote, and you're in time for the second one. Wonderful. Um, Chris, do you mind giving a brief summary of what we just heard? For sure. Tom? These um, properties are at the corner of Stanley Street and Belchertown Road, Route 9. Um, they're just in from Belchertown Road. They're the first houses that you see there. And um, the idea is that the property line between the two properties would be changed from the dotted line, which is kind of slanted, to the more vertical line, which is a solid line. Um, and that would allow um, enough room for duplexes to be built on each of these properties. Both properties are over the um, required lot area. The required lot area is 26,000 square feet. So you can see the lot on the left is 26,068 square feet and the lot on the right is 26,521 square feet. So the developer who has developed a duplex across the street wants to remove the existing buildings on these properties um, and I think it's all of the buildings, but I'm not sure. And he will have to go through the historical commission to do that. Um, and he wants to build new duplex housing on these two properties. So that's the idea here. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, Tom and Lud, do you have any questions? I think Tom froze. There he is. There he is. All right, thank you, thank you for keep keep trying, Tom. All right, so we'll we'll go through that... the vote, and um, maybe I'll start with you, Tom. Are you? I'm going to abstain. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, abstain. And uh, Andrew. Hi. All right, Janet. Hi. Johanna. Hi. And Maria? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna approve. Okay, so that's five in favor with uh, one or one abstention and one absence. All right, uh, so the time now is 9.35. Um, item seven on our agenda, any upcoming ZBA applications, Pam? There is just one new one. Um, the ZBA is going to consider an application for 47 Valley Lane. Um, it's a special permit request. They are going to do a converted dwelling and increase the number of residential units to two. So it's currently a single family. Um, so this duplex, I guess we would call it a duplex. Um, would be sort of a top and bottom unit. 
So the upper unit would have three bedrooms and two baths and the lower unit would have three bedrooms and one bath. And one thing that was a little interesting about this is that primarily this parcel is in Amherst, but there is a little portion that actually spills into Hadley. Okay. So that's gonna go in front of the ZBA on February 24th, but you can let us know if you would be interested in the presentation. Um, Chris, does this have any particularly interesting zoning aspects that we might want to hear about? I'm not aware of any. Oh, yeah, not aware okay. of any. Okay. All right. right. So, so what do people feel about this? Would they, would they like to get a presentation on this? Janet? Is, is this going to be like owner occupied or is it um, just kind of converting to a two family house? I don't know the answer to that question, Janet. I'm sorry, I could find it out, but at this moment, I don't know the answer. I know, because we've, we've asked to see some of these conversions to, you know, multifamily to kind of think about that process, or if it's student housing and things like that. So I'd be interested in that, knowing that before. If it was owner occupied, I think I'd be less concerned or interested. Okay. So this is going to the zoning board on the 24th, is that right? That is correct. And uh, the next time the planning board is gonna meet is March 2nd. I guess we'll miss so, our chance, yeah. So if you wanted to see it, um, they the ZBA would have to continue the public hearing. I, I don't think I, I'm that interested though. But I, okay, I don't wanna so say anything though. All right, but I can let you know if this is um, gonna be owner occupied. Yeah. All right, I, I see Nate's hand. Maybe he has some information. Yeah, thanks. Based on the property card, it's not owner occupied. So the last few years, it, it hasn't been. Um, I'm just looking at the GIS. Um, and so it has, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it has a rental permit. Uh, rental permits going back until, um, it's like actually a few years, but um, the property cards for the last two years say not owner occupied. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Andrew. Yeah, I don't know the property here. Um, I just had to pull it up on the map, but I think this is this is kind of the sort of the cute, dense neighborhood that's sort of just north of campus. I, I guess I'm curious um, what the parking situation is going to be here. <laughs> like these are small lots, right? And if they're if this is, I'm not sure if this is kind of primarily student housing or not, but uh, I would I would be willing to hear from them. Okay. Well, so Chris, it sounds like we have some interest on the board. Okay. And um, I guess, you know, you can just let the ZBA know that we have some interest, but, you know, they can, I guess it's their decision on whether to continue or not. Mm hmm Very good. Okay. Um, next item, uh, upcoming special permit, site plan review, subdivision applications. Uh, do we have any of those? We have a new definitive subdivision application for um, the parcels at 446 and 462 Main Street. And this is a continuation of the um, effort to freeze the zoning on those properties because of the change in the zoning bylaw with regard to mixed use buildings. So that's Mr. Robleski who's coming forward with this. So you'll be seeing that. Um, that just came in the other day. So I don't think we've even put it into the system. And my guess is you'll see it in late March or early April. Okay. Um, and then let's see, do we have any others, Pam? Oh, did I, I think you knew about the four, I think you knew about the four um, preliminary subdivision plans that were mm -hmm. filed for property of um, Coles. Oh, I don't, I I don't think the this. board has heard that. That I first heard about that at town council for the first reading of the solar moratorium, which was after our board meeting. Yeah, so, um, 
Cindy Jones filed four preliminary subdivision plans um, for four parcels, four, they're more than parcels. Each area includes several parcels, but, um, and that's an effort to freeze the zoning. And I don't know whether her primary um, concern is the solar moratorium or whether it's the upcoming solar bylaw or exactly what it is. But um, in any event, we have these preliminary subdivision plans and you'll be seeing those. Um, those I think are gonna come before you on March 16th. So. Okay. Would would that does that filing um, if the moratorium is passed? Does that mean that the, the moratorium wouldn't apply? That's right, because the moratorium is a zoning bylaw. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else on up, upcoming applications? I don't think so. All right. Um, Time is 9.42, item nine is planning board committee and liaison reports. Jack is absent for PVPC. Um, Andrew, anything you wanna say about CPAC? Uh, I've got nothing to say, we haven't planned that. Okay, Tom, uh, Tom's back, DRB. We'll see, we'll see how my Wi-Fi holds up. Um, we just had a meeting yesterday um, and it was this basic downtown um, signage and visuals that were being approved. We uh, looked at um, the new Drake. Um, essentially what they need to do is swap the access doors on the second level from perpendicular to the road to parallel to the road. Um, so it changes the facade a little bit. Um, and that's for um, egress purposes. So. Um, some simple changes there that were approved. Um, the Henyon Bakery is going to become a vegan bakery called the Humble Peach at some point in the spring. Um, and they are just proposing some color changes and facade changes for their brand, as well as some outdoor seating, which was approved. Um, and then the, there's a sign on Triangle Street for um, the East Hampton Savings Bank that is an ad that will be changing monthly, which created some strange conversations about how we approve something that's going to change. So um, we approve the frame and the contents as proposed, but we will, uh, we're looking for some kind of process by which we can review seasonal advertising on the facade of a building. So that's... Um, that was partially approved and we're, we're exploring options going forward. So that's what I got. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Chris, anything on CRC? CRC is meeting on the 24th, um, which is next Thursday. Is that right? Next Thursday? Yeah. Um, and they're going to be talking about the comprehensive housing policy. And looking at that and thinking about, you know, um, what has been done, what what do they want to focus on? Um, just kind of getting a sense of imp implementation of the comprehensive housing policy. And there's something else that they're going to be looking at. I think it's um, the zoning priorities list that I put together and I presented to you tonight. I think that they're going to be looking at that. So. Okay. All right. Uh, next item, report of the chair. Uh, I don't really have a report. I have one question for Chris and actually for the board. Um, I, it occurred to me it might be nice if we tried to meet in person once a quarter. So my question for the board is, would you be supportive in, you know, schlepping into town hall once a quarter? Um, and then for Chris, it would be, could you talk to the, you know, whether it's Amherst Media or the town staff about whether we would be able to get the support we needed to do that? So I understand that no one is going to meet in person except town council until April 1st. And so if you wanted to talk about meeting after April 1st, I think um, that is certainly a possibility. 
So okay. do you want me to explore that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I understood that part of the reason we weren't meeting in person had to do with the video and recording support. Um, and so I thought I'd just see if we could get a very limited amount. Um, you know, we had that one in-person meeting last summer, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I thought that was good. It's nice to uh, see how everybody looks below the waist, you know? <laughs> so I, um, I don't know what the town manager is going to do. Uh, I don't know what the governor is going to do. And sort of this depends on the governor. If the governor says no more meeting remotely after April 1st, then we don't have this opportunity to meet on Zoom anymore. And we have to meet in person. Um, if we are still allowed to meet on Zoom and you all want to meet in person once in a while, then that's something that I would have to explore with um, the town manager and IT. So. I can yeah, I guess that's that's the sort of scenario I was thinking if you could just explore that, you know, to a limited degree and just find out whether it's something we could work toward or whether we should just hold off. Mm -hmm. And Great. that's really all I had in my my two minutes of report of the chair. Chris, do you have a staff report you want to give? I don't really. Um, I'm looking forward to this year and there are a lot of exciting things happening and um, yeah, looking forward to working with you all. So that's it. All right. Okay, so the time is 948 and I think we're adjourned. Thank you all for Thanks. another Thank good evening of conversation. Good all. Good night. Oh, good night. Hold, hold on. I, whoops. Could I see Dorothy up? Pam's got her hand up. Oh, so she she I left. So I guess I guess I missed it. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs>